now 6.30, so we are going to uh, reconvene the, the uh, September 20th um, meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And um, there were no uh, reportable actions taken in closed session. Um, I'll ask staff and other directors, are there any additions and deletions to the open session agenda? I have none. Okay. Um, then we'll move on to the oral communications portion of the meeting. And um, so this is a time that you can speak on any subject within the purview of the Water District, uh, preferably not on anything that's on tonight's agenda. And the uh, limitation on that is three minutes. So um, who would like to speak? I see Ms. Lowen. Pardon? Um, the, or the, yeah, the podium. Okay, go ahead. Um, that would be a convenience for the recording. Thank you. Um, Mr. Holloway. I'm Bruce Holloway from Boulder Group. Um, at the last board meeting, uh, there was an agenda item to hire an interim district manager. And uh, in the discussion at the time, it became clear that there was an application from John Presley, who is the retired uh, Santa Cruz County Public Works Director. Um, it was a little bit unclear during the meeting uh, exactly who the person was, he, his name wasn't said exactly, and um, later on I obtained the uh, application, the resume, uh, which had been sent to the entire board prior to the last board meeting. Um, also, I requested the resignation letter from uh, former 
district manager, Brian Lee, which was not in the packet for the last board meeting. Um, and so these two items, the resignation letter, which uh, led to the appointment of the interim district manager, and the application from John Presley, uh, these were not presented to the public. And that is a Brannock violation as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the Brannock's very clear that uh, when there's an open meeting, an open session for an open meeting, that all materials that are presented to the majority of the board should be presented to the public prior to the meeting or maybe even uh, left up here at, you know, so we can receive them. Um, so, I'm in uh, despair and dismay that this board will ever comply with the Brown Act. Uh, you seem to think that anything you get is confidential, you don't need to share it with us. But the fact is that um, that application from Mr. Presley was kind of pitched in over the transom. If, um, if Mr. Presley was applying for the finance director position, for example, then uh, the, whoever was the district manager at the time would be in a position to say, hey, show me your resume, and I'll treat it in confidence. But because of the particular situation that there was last month, when there was no district manager, because the district manager had resigned, Mr. Presley is a sophisticated, has a sophisticated understanding of the Brown Act. And he pitched his resume over the transom without any, without any assurance that it would be kept confidential. And he knew, he knew that that was the precise moment when the board might make a decision one way or the other about an interim district manager. And that's the exact moment when this, when the public should have been aware that Mr. Presley uh, had made an application. So you violated the Brown Act, and I don't know when you're going to begin to abide by it. Um, okay. Anybody else want to comment during oral? Okay. Seeing none. Um, I will think about Mr. Holloway's comments and think about them. Thank you. Um, so we will move on to 9A, um, the edu education grant final report under unfinished business. And um, I'll let staff um, introduce this if they'd like to. Um, Jen, okay. So, um, one of the one of the 2016 watershed education grants that was awarded was to Fred and Roberta McPherson for to make a movie or video called The Turkey Foot, which describes uh, the area of the San Lorenzo River where um, where Bear Creek, Bear Creek, and Boulder Creek join the San Lorenzo River, correct? And, um, and so Fred and Mick Roberta are here tonight to present their video to the board for your consideration for acceptance of their final, this is their final report. So. Right. I'd just like to say that uh, it's a pleasure to be here and share it. It's taken us a good year to, to get this done. And uh, a lot of time uh, was spent in uh, writing the script and doing the research for it. And uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here to present it tonight. We presented one uh, oh, two or three years ago about Fall Creek, which dealt with the southern end of the Ben Loman Mountain and our intakes on Fall Creek and uh, our treatment plant there. This one deals with the northern end of the, the, the mountain uh, where we uh, have our other uh, surface water intake. So, it's sort of a compliment to the one we've done before. So we can see it, and if there's any questions afterwards, we'd be glad to answer the questions. Great. I'm going to hit the lights, and we'll get
eastern boundary of the San Lorenzo Valley and the San Lorenzo River watershed is somewhat subtle and difficult to distinguish, looking toward Loma Prieta, the highest peak in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Ben Lomond Mountain, as the western boundary, is the most visible and therefore obvious edge, extending from its southern end at the Pogonip area of Santa Cruz to Boulder Creek, the northernmost town <coughs> in the San Lorenzo Valley. The eastern facing slope of Ben Lomond Mountain was formed by the vertical movement of the now inactive Ben Lomond Fault. Along the northern end of the mountain, the Ben Lomond Fault and Zianti Fault, which is still active today, both played an important role in the formation of the Boulder Creek area. Because of the way Boulder Creek enters the river from the west in the area known to local residents as the Junction, and just a few hundred yards upriver, Bear Creek flows in from the east, early settlers thought the pattern they formed resembled the foot of a turkey with the center and back toes of the San Lorenzo River and the two side toes representing each creek. When we examine the early newspapers, the first reference to the turkey foot is in 1874 when the crews were surveying the area for the San Lorenzo Valley Food and Transportation Company. It is proposed to commence blooming at or near Felton and extend the work to the mouth of Boulder, Bear, and San Lorenzo Creek, which forms a turkey foot. A year later, the area was referred to as the Forks, and in that year, during the dispute of, as to where the location of the post office should be, either Boulder Creek or Lorenzo, this was called the natural center of the neighborhood. Junction Park operated by the Boulder Creek Rec Department, is a popular spot in the summer for sunbathing and swimming, bunching off of diving rock, and community festivals. Throughout the year, there are also great opportunities for enjoying a myriad of wildlife, like mallards, wood ducks, and the elusive American dipper. As the northeastern end of Ben Lomond Mountain was uplifted vertically along the Zianti Fault, the harder granitic quartz diorite that forms the core of the mountain was exposed and broken off in irregular chunks along Boulder Creek's upper tributaries. The jagged edges of the various sized boulders were then tumbled and rounded as they were carried from their origins down into Boulder Creek where the tumbling and smoothing continued all the way to the San Lorenzo River. Along their journey, the tumbling rocks acted like grist in a mill, carving out and exposing successive layers of the softer sedimentary sandstones, eroding away over millions of years, and helping to form Boulder Creek and parts of the Turkey Foot cutting down deeper here than almost any other place in the San Lorenzo Valley. More recent sandstone formations were cut through, all the way down into the underlying Butano sandstone, one of the oldest sedimentary formations in the Santa Cruz Mountains, which is exposed at Junction Park's diving rock, as well as upstream along Boulder Creek in the area of its confluence with Foreman Creek one of Boulder Creek's important tributaries. Along Boulder Creek is a beautiful riparian forest with white alders, part of a habitat that includes
these mineral loving California sisters, water striders, and overwintering ladybugs. <coughs> In winter, almost all of the water supply for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District comes from surface water, allowing the district to wet its well. All of that surface water comes from Ben Lomond Mountain, and much of that surface water comes from tributaries to Boulder Creek, including Devine, Silver, and Foreman Creeks. In the summer, the district's water supply comes from wells in the sand hills, predominantly in the areas of Ben Lomond, Diane, and Olympia. Above the confluence of Foreman and Boulder Creek is the district's Boulder Creek treatment plant. Here, water is treated from the three tributaries to Boulder Creek, Devine, Silver, and Foreman, along with water from the Rob Menzies Five Mile Pipeline to the south, carried in from Clear Creek and Sweetwater Creek before being distributed throughout the San Lorenzo Valley. Lower Bear Creek cuts down into the same Butano sandstone formation found at the junction and on the northeastern end of Ben Lomond Mountain. It is particularly well exposed in the area of the Bonnie Briar Gorge, which also contains mysterious rock inclusions that have strange forms, almost like burrows on a redwood tree. Walking Bear Creek provides many opportunities to investigate the geology of the area. She's definitely in the key, inside of this, this open mm -hmm. so we see the environment. But maybe this broke off, uh, mm -hmm. let me this is the road. This is Along the creek, it's also possible to discover primordial plants like liverworts, mosses, and graceful lady ferns. Not far from the Turkey Foot area, Ben Lomond Fault is joined by the Zianti Fault, dividing the watershed into fairly distinct geological and hydrological regions. Everything north of the Zianti Fault, which includes the Bear Creek watershed, is not well suited to providing a large water supply for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District because the underlying geological formations in this area lack the extensive granitic aquifers found south of the Zianti Fault on Ben Lomond Mountain. With the coming of winter rains, waterfalls form in steep hidden canyons all throughout the Bear Creek watershed. During one particularly heavy rain, a large Douglas fir became wedged by its root into an old cement dam above the Bonnie Briar Gorge. Fisheries biologist Don Allen was called in for his assessment of the situation. I think this is a serious problem. You don't have an obstruction in here. The fish can get through the dam above them fairly easily. The first thing you need to do is get this done the spur out of the way because it's it's got the uh, the jump is it's double in height and about four feet at the sill of the dam is now eight feet. And it also goes beyond the dam, so it's hanging over the slot. Don contacted Kristen Kittleson, fishery resource planner for the county of Santa Cruz. After checking the obstruction, John Maugery from Santa Cruz County Public Works was able to clear the way for open water flow to the dam, averting what could have developed into a big problem. After the dam was cleared, Don and Kristen returned to check the opening. A 
A huge problem did develop not far downstream during a torrential rainstorm in early 2017 when a failed drain pipe washed out half of Lower Bear Creek Road. The San Lorenzo Valley Water District was quick to respond to the emergency, making certain there was no interruption of water service to over a thousand of their customers along Bear Creek Road. We put in a pipe line, so we just run through here. Yeah. It's really close to the end of where it's broken away there. It's not exposed, but it's really close to it. Yeah. So, in case it does go, and when they do construction, we're going to need a bypass. Yeah. So, we put an emergency bypass in it. Eventually, public works spread black plastic over the area to help prevent further sliding. The same storm caused a large log jam at the point where Bear Creek enters the San Lorenzo River. Fortunately, it was washed away a few days later, but the heavy <coughs> rains continued. Quiet Little Boulder Creek rose to within a short distance of the Junction Park fence, carrying away huge logs as it merged with the San Lorenzo River, causing more sliding, burying the sandy beach where swimmers and sunbathers had gathered during the summer, and submerging most of Diamond Rock and the Dam Down River in its rush toward the sea. Very cool. Um, <laughs> I think sometimes we take a, for granted the place we live in, and it helps for somebody to point out how special a place we're in. So I haven't really thought through this process. After you know, we have a excellent presentation as far as I'm concerned, and I would like to open it up to um, the public um, to for comments or. Um, 
you know, some thoughts, and um, if Fred would like to take a question or two, that would be good. Would anybody like to comment from the public at this point? Okay, I, do, I don't see anybody. Um, we'll bring back to the board for our thoughts, and I think I've got a question or two, but I'll, I'll you know, offer it to uh, other directors. Okay, anybody want to make a... Fred and Roberta, uh, thank you again for the beautiful piece. That was just delightful. What a nice adventure in our neighborhood. Um, I know some of the reason for the, the Bear Creek area not being very good for um, large water supplies, just again, the granitic, there's like no, it's the Pucano sandstone, so it's not very permeable, is that right? And I have heard that there are old oil wells in that area. Is that true, or is that like urban legend? Well, there's way up in the upper watershed, there's some old oil uh, hmm. sites, but there's a number of uh, kind of impermeable uh, aquifers up Bear Creek and Kings Creek and uh, Deer Creek and uh, all those areas. Uh, even there's wells up there, individual homeowners and wells, but uh, it's not uh, like down here in uh, Coil Hollow or up in the Olympia Quarry or somewhere like that, where there's a really good uh, groundwater supply, or up on the Ben Roman Mountain, <coughs> there's uh, the surface water supply that's so good. So that, that's why it's different. And, and, uh, and this groundwater study that you're doing now, uh, they're considering that, and that there's different basins, <coughs> groundwater basins in the aquifers. So up, up above, designing your fall, it's not very good for a big supplies. Can I take a step closer oh. to the Thank you. Yeah. I, I'm just thinking, I, I, I'm always amazed that, you know, how turbid that water, and I know, like, I remember hearing some figures about, you know, you would think after all this time that it would, that there's still so much, the amount of sediment that the river still continues to um, take out, it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, how, because <coughs> you just look at that water, and you know, everybody says it's like, oh, that's like the milk chick water, <laughs> you know. So, but, you know, I think there's some interest in trying to collect some of that water, but it's, you know, it's got so much turbidity, but uh, I don't know if you knew exactly how much sediment um, gets, goes all the way to the ocean, basically. Yeah. From, yeah. Well, that, that, that's a yeah. challenge, because it yeah. does have that turbidity, and it is difficult to treat, especially out of the river, mm -hmm. not directly like that. That's why the, the city of Santa Cruz doesn't pump it up in the Loch Lomond when it's uh, turbid like that. Mm -hmm. It waits until it settles down. Then they pump it up. And I know at our treatment plants, we can't use the turbid water either at, at, uh, on Fall Creek or at the Boulder Creek place. You have to wait till it settles. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that erosion, well, that turbidity. There's erosion, there's more vineyards, there's more construction, there's a lot more activity in that for water. Shape. So it's a challenge. Yeah, that, that, I think that also I think I think is a real interest in this valley is to provide that erosion control to, to, to minimize that amount of sediment that you know. Yeah. And there's a lot of storm drain design, you know, to try to. Um, but it's, it's a, I mean it's a big it's a big big issue. That, you know, You're so. right. Yeah. So I'd I'd like to ask um, Fred a question. I'm I'm curious about the phenomenon of the turkey foot because it looks like uh, you've got a fault coming across. You've got the Zayani fault coming across there. Does it make a jog? Is there a fracture? So what? You've got Bear Creek coming in at one point and um, well, like Boulder Creek coming in. It, it's only about hundred. It's like from here down to the river away. It's only maybe hundred yards of separation. And it's you're exactly right. It's because the Zioni Fault goes right through there, goes, you know, right down Bear Creek, maybe a little jog, you know, as it cuts through that formation there at the, the junction. But then it goes right up uh, Boulder Creek and on out through Big Basin and eventually out into, um, you know, uh, Rancho de Oso and the uh, uh, the fault offshore. And, and uh, what, what I found so fascinating, it took me so long to research, is I finally figure out which way the Zioni Fault is moving. It is sort of like the San Andreas is moving sideways. The southern part is going one way, but the southern part is also going up a little bit. And it's, but it's been doing that for millions of years. And that's why there's such an offset there along the Zioni Fault going right 
Bear Creek and Boulder Creek. It, it's, that's why the northern end of Ben Lomond Mountain is higher. It's pretty high. It's one of the highest points on Ben Lomond Mountain is right up there, Eagle Rock. So it's fascinating. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning. That's one of, been one of the treats about doing this. I've learned so much. Okay. Um, you have I just really appreciate it. It was fun to see a little bit of geology. and We've been talking about the Butano Formation in you know other parts of the basin, so it's fun to see it out there at the surface. So. Roberta did. Is, she's the creation. She's the uh, uh, script writer, and she did the narrative. Uh, and uh, so she's a the, the artistic creative force. I, I really like that geeky stuff, like geology and the wildlife <coughs> stuff like that. Okay. Thank you. Um, with any staff uh, feedback, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll give you a chance. Update if you have to do accept the report. Yeah, we, we will do that. <laughs> we won't forget to do that. We'll feel really happy put that on our website, and Fred will be going around and touring and sharing the, the video with other groups of, of people in the, in the valley. Okay, great. Jeff? Yes. I have a question. Is it going to be at the science night? This, you know, in October. We are still working on coordinating that, but um, it might. Okay. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> so if there's, the board doesn't have any more um, questions, then I'll, okay, we have one um, action that we need to consider this evening, and that is to whether to uh, accept this final report. And if there's any discussion or a motion would be. Uh, I, 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 I have approve approval of this beautiful report submitted as part of the Watershed Education Grant received by President Bernie. I'll second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think we can probably do this by uh, voice. Um, all in favor, um, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Very good. Thank you very much, both of you, for this. Okay. Beautiful. So, um, but we have a big agenda tonight, or at least uh, numerous items. So let's move on to 9B, which is the uh, Lompico Assessment District Oversight Committee appointments. So I would like to uh, get this started by, uh, okay, introduce, you know, any staff? Um, yes, uh, as the board is aware that there are three openings on the Lompico Assessment District Oversight Committee. At the August 2018 Board of Directors meeting, the board delayed filling vacancies on the committee to ensure compliance with the MADI Act. The direct mailer informing the PICO customers that the district was accepting applications to the Oversight Committee was mailed to all of PICO customers. The district has received five applications from customers of Lumpico to participate as a public member of the Oversight Committee. Uh, their applications are in your board packet for review. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I've made a few notes about how I think might be a good process for uh, doing this. And the first thing I do is like to ask the applicants, okay, who ha are here today, um, if they would like to, to uh, speak to their qualifications and interest and in why they're here uh, for um, no more than three minutes. And then um, I'll take public comment after that, so I'll get uh, feedback from the public. And then, um, Perhaps one part of the process could be that uh, we'd like to ask, okay, each director could ask a question of all of the applicants tonight. So it would not be, uh, it would be targeted. So you don't have to respond. You know, we're gonna limit it to one minute, so it would be a quick thing. And then after um, doing that, we'll um, implement a process that I hope uh, that I'll describe when I get to it for doing the appointments. And and then hopefully it, um, after having had that sort of discussion through that process, we'll be able to uh, have some consensus on maybe how we will proceed and I'll ask for a motion and a second for all appointments at the same time. And we'll see how this goes. And then we'll vote on that. Um, okay, and hopefully we'll have a filled LADOC committee. I look forward to that being the case. Uh, LADOC has not had a quorum for too long and it'll be good to get things moving with a full, okay, committee. And I'm glad we're um, able to do that probably tonight. So um, let's, um, I haven't thought about, um, would anybody, any of the applicants at this point like to initiate, a, you know, and say something about themselves? Um, I would be happy to speak, but I went first last time, so I will be first. 
May I ask whoever's speaking to come to the um, lectern so that we can, everyone can hear it later? I see, um, Ms. Gomez. Thank you. Um, anybody else? No. Sir? Yeah, I'm Dennis Lynch. <coughs> I've lived in Mount Pico since uh, 1987. And Jenny asked me to apply to the laid out committee. And uh, I, I felt like <coughs> I really haven't given back that much to my community over the years. So this would be a good opportunity. Um, my background is in real estate appraisal. I've been an appraiser since 1992, uh, all over Monterey and San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, I have some knowledge of uh, mortgage finance, so I think that, that would be transferable to, <laughs> to this position. So um, I hope you can see that and approve me. Okay. Thank you. Okay, my name is John Wright. I live in Long Pico. I've been there for three years, and the reason I want to be on the committee is basically what everyone else described, so I can give back to my community and raise my children there. Um, so I felt that this would be a way to, to do something. To, and my background, Basically, I graduated from um, San Jose State with a degree in finance, some accounting background, and now I currently <coughs> excuse me, manage a construction company. So, um, yeah, so I think I'm qualified to, to be on the committee. So, thank you. Thank you. that there are people, more people applying for this committee. And, and I think what this committee needs is a really broad range of experience and people. And I'd like to see new people to Lump Pico be on it, and I'd like to see old-time residents be on it. Um, I think there's an excellent chance here for having a good committee. Last time, I encouraged you to, to appoint Jenny and I, because we were the only ones at that point. But considering that Jenny is on another committee, I think we can reevaluate that and, and get more voices from Lampico working in different areas of the district. So in reviewing the applicants, um, we have two people very strong accounting backgrounds. Carolyn Chabot, who was not here, I think really succinctly answered the application. She said she wanted to be better informed and be able to inform new neighbors. And that's exactly, I think, the point of the oversight committee. I had an excellent meeting review at the invitation of, for all applicants with district manager Rick Rogers and, our, and Stephanie Hill, our um, finance manager, had a really good discussion. And I think I was able to put across my ideas of what I have a vision for Lada 
and going into the future. And I think I, that we came up with some really good ideas on how to make this more effective. The primary purpose of this is to gain public trust. And I think that what I bring to the committee is, I've lived in Long Pico for 40 years. Uh, my husband and I had a construction company for 32 years, specializing in solar thermal water heating. We know project management. I did all the accounting for our business, payroll taxes, tax returns. So I'm very familiar with financial aspects of it. Um, I worked on two committees when we were in Long Pico, the um, Citizen Advisory Committee that worked with the, the community directly on answering questions about the merger, and also on the Grant and Loan Committee. And as I said last time, on the Grant and Loan Committee, I worked with two directors who were very much opposed to the merger. We were on opposite sides of the aisle, and yet we were able to work together to do a really effective reporting and analysis. And I included some of the reports that we've generated in the board packet this time. So that I'd like to talk about politics. Sometimes politics get in the way of doing a really good job. And I know that this has become very political. And as I said last time, I applied in good faith thinking, I want to do the best for Long Pico. I want, and when this report looks good, it makes San Lorenzo Valley Water District look good. And that's my effort to look both of those good, to regain the trust of Long Pico, to do a really good job of analysis. And looking at bond committees, their, their number one thing is we take our job very seriously. We look at everything and we report it back. And that's my goal as well. And I hope that I will be appointed to the committee. I have so many ideas of things I want to do going forward. And I'm thinking, if one of the, the gentlemen who has a strong accounting background applied for the finance committee, we would have a perfect world here. Thank you. Thank you. OK, um, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm sorry if Ms. Chapeau uh, maybe could not be here. So um, this is the point. I'd like to open this up to public comment. Um, would anybody like to comment? Um, Ms. Henry. Lois Henry. I've lived in Long Pico for four to seven years. I worked on the merger agreement from 2010 to 2016. Debbie Lowen was right there with me, helping. She wasn't on the board, but she was a big help. And I got this email from John Hayes in August. He said, I'm headed up to Portland for a few days. We'll be back Friday. Please be nice to Chuck, Margaret, and Jean while I'm gone. You and Debbie should take them to lunch or out for coffee to clear the air. Beating them up is not a strategy to get Debbie on Laddock. Time to build a bridge. The only person you can change is you. We have never beat up Chuck, Jean, and Margaret. Nancy Macy said to me one day, you've been a great advocate for Long Pico. And that's what we've been, advocates. We haven't called you names. We haven't told you you don't know what you're doing. Actually, here's somebody, not us, who was really not very nice to people who used words like crank, totally irresponsible, tin foil hat level crank, hysterical, all gut feeling, no reason. That's beating people up. We have never, ever done that to you. We have come to you with our concerns. We've talked to you about our concerns. And now the grand jury has come in and said, hey folks, you don't seem to know what's going on with Long Pico, and you need to fix things. And I think that Debbie is a perfect choice. 
Jenny's a good person, but I thought the idea of citizen people is so more citizens can come in and work with the district. She's already on a committee. I don't have a problem with her being on, on the ladder. And maybe Debbie's idea about the fellow in the green shirt, maybe he'd be great for finance. Uh, although maybe you'll think Juan Pico's trying to take over the district. But I just hope you do the right thing here. Whether you like us or don't like us shouldn't enter into this. What should enter into this is who's going to do the good job for Lada and for Long people. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Holloway. Um, thanks. Um, the board president began this discussion by talking about the MADI Act. So something uh, was brought up at the last meeting about the MADI Act. And um, I wasn't here when that happened. I went out to get a sandwich or something because it was a long meeting uh, last month. Um, think about doing the same right now. But um, <clears throat> I looked it up after the meeting, and the MADI Act applies to local agencies that happen to be cities or counties. It doesn't apply to a special district like this one. Um, so I don't know what to say. Um, I think you should be a little bit more transparent, a little bit more open. If you're getting advice from your attorney that the Mandy Act does not apply to this district, I think you should share it with the community so that we don't, we're not just all <laughs> scratching our heads and wondering what the heck is the Mandy Act and uh, what, what are we in violation of. So I'm just going to say, as far as I can tell, uh, this district cannot be in violation of the Mandy Act because it does, it's not subject to the Mandy Act. Uh, and that's my main message here, but uh, <laughs> I have a lot more to say on other uh, California law than that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other public comments? Hi, Bob Fultz with Boulder Creek. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think one of the things that uh, Grant Jury spoke about was the need for more public outreach. The board has an excellent opportunity tonight to do that. And I think the board should consider not turning people away who volunteer to serve their community. I think everybody that volunteers should have a place. And whether that's the expansion of the Laddock Committee to seven, or nine, or however many people want to volunteer to help, or whether you follow um, Deb Lowen's suggestion of making sure that everybody serves in one committee. Um, I think it would be a real shame to turn away people who obviously have motivation and skills that the district could sorely use. And I think it would give, be a tremendous signal to the community that this board, after four years of having issues that were identified in the grand jury were to use this situation as an opportunity to start turning that around. Um, I don't know um, two of the people myself, but from their backgrounds, they look more than qualified to be able to serve on it or the finance committee. And I urge the board to find a place for everybody who wants to serve to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? I don't see anybody raising a hand, so I'll close out the public comment on this. Okay, um, now we'll bring it back to uh, the board for process of doing this, and I'll explain a little bit more about how I think maybe would be a good way to uh, do this. And that so what I have in mind doing, uh, one of the things that bothers me is uh, in a matter like this that you have uh, sometimes a tendency for somebody to jump in and uh, you know, say, you know, this is the way I think things should be and I make a motion of that and then you, know, you wait for a second. And you don't you know, get the thoughts of everybody in the process. 
So um, I propose, uh, you know, if the board concurs or at least comes close to concurrence on this, is that we uh, set this up. Um, I've asked uh, that Holly be prepared to pick director's names out. So it will not be up to me or, okay, any of the directors to, you know, jump in quickly as to who will speak first on this. And then I will ask um, all the directors in that order um, to uh, so select or, uh, you know, comment favorably on three people. And then I'll make notes on that, see where we stand on that, and then um, I'll evaluate that and see if we are at a place we can make appointments or whether uh, we need to go perhaps a little bit further on that. So, Holly, would you um, pull a number or a name from the hat? The first name is Director Bruce. Okay. Um, and then I would go ahead and do, okay, let's get all the names. Second name is President Bachman. Okay. Director Smallman. And guess who the last one is? <laughs> Default. Do we want something? Okay. So what I'll do is I'll go through this in this order first, and if we need to go back, I'll go back from the bottom and go back towards the top. So, but before that, um, do we want to have any discussion or thoughts on that? Um, one of the things I thought we could do, if any director wanted to ask a question of one of the applicants, um, they could do so with this. I limit it to a minute, and but it would be one that would be hopefully appropriate for all. And. Um, would you like to exercise it? I have a clarifying question. Okay. Um, if I, if I, I have a question I might like to pose, but it's the same question I would pose to each of the applicants. So would each of them answer in turn? How would that work? That's my idea of doing that. Okay. Um, so, um, okay, I have a couple of nods, and I think that's I'm good. Sorry. And um, in that, um, but, so, um, so Margaret gets to go first, and okay, uh, in the selection process, so I'll ask Bill. Okay, to, um, if you want to pose a question to yeah, I, the applicants, yeah, I think I, we have a kind of basic, you know, general question that you know would be what would I would like to hear a response from each, each applicant. Um, I'll start with this gentleman. Well, well, ask the question. No, the question, and then the, all the applicants will address respond that, respond to, to that each, question. Okay. All right. So. Uh, Chuck, do you, want, do you want me to go first, or do you want Bill to go first? Oh, you want to yeah. let well, Margaret's probably go first, because she was the first. First name out of the hat. She was out of the hat. Okay, we'll do that then. Okay. So my, my question to each of the applicants, and I don't know which order we want to take this, and perhaps the order in which they introduce themselves, just to keep everything straight. Um, representing Wapiko, what is the single or what, it, what is the top issue you think your Long Pico neighbors are most interested in? Okay, um, I believe Jenny, you were the... We're talking uh, uh, district-wise for the, for the laid off. Water district-wise with regard to the laid off and the representation of Long Pico on the um, I think that they would like transparency and to know that their tax money is being well spent and that it's going to the projects that as far as what's being spent where and on which projects and, and things that that information would be available to them. Thank you, thank you. And just uh, for Holly, I want to limit this to one minute. I don't know whether you're utilizing that timing. That's fine. Okay, I didn't know whether you were. Okay. Chuck, did you ask the people to either go to the lecture or to speak up? Oh, um, because I yes. Because I don't hear half the answer. Um, um, yes, if you didn't mind. Um. I think that the most important issue for the LADOC um, committee is to provide transparency to um, the community um, so that they know that their assessment money is being spent um, on what it's supposed to be spent, the project 
projects that were outlined in the engineering report um, and that the information will be available to them um, in a you know, timely and regular basis and that they have somebody they can go to and you know, perhaps the website and, and they can get the information on you know, their assessment money and how it's being spent. Thank you. And um, were you, I think you were the second person? Mr. Okay. Lynch. Mr. Lynch. Okay. And Mr. Wright, I think you were the. Yeah, I think what the residents of Long Pico basically want is to understand where their money is going, how it's being spent. Maybe I don't know if it's something that's available, but more of a timeline of how projects are being carried out um, or when they're going to be carried out. You know, information of that nature. Mm -hmm. Well, I can answer it in less than a minute. It's absolutely what's happening to six hundred dollars a year that we're paying, or three hundred dollars a year, I'm sorry, per customer. Some of them are six. Um, where's our money going for? Is the agreement being followed? Where can I go to find out the information quickly? This is why we need a, a really good website. People do not care to come to meetings, but they rely on other people to go to meetings and figure all this out for them and give them the information in a very succinct and way that it's, um, you have full trust that it's been looked at completely. Thank you. Um, you were expressing an interest in asking a question, okay. I believe. Okay. Um, I, well, my question would, just, would be kind of pretty simple. I would like to know, like, when, you know, moved to Lompico. Um, I, I, I was elected in 2008 on the Lompico Water District Board. I'd like to know exactly, you know, when, basically, I, I know you understand what this board is basically for. There's, you know, two point nine million dollars of bill. Okay, this is this is all part of my question. That the 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 district the, um, bond oversight committee, and I would like to know that your understanding of exactly your job at the at the, the thing is how much time have you looked at um, the exact two point nine million dollars exactly what those items are for, and you're familiar already with that, and you, you, the, you, the, the, you understand that your responsibility of that this money is going to be spent and to, to just basically keep track of it. So I, I just want to know how much, how much you're familiar already and how much, exactly how much time have you spent looking at this, uh, at the Long Pico and how much experience you have with that. So, okay. Um, sure. And when you moved, I guess is not really the gist of it. But if that's one, if you want to say that too, okay. There's a couple of questions in there, but go ahead. I uh, received an email. I can't remember the name of the person who sent it to me, and it contained two PDF files. And one of them was a uh, sort of an outline of, of the expenditures. Briefly looked at it and add it up and make sure uh, you know, everything balanced. But uh, that's that was, that's the basic. Well, you, you said um, no, you no, no, in, no, uh, no, no, Bill, no. I have to interrupt. It, we, you've asked a question, and we want to. This is not an interview process. No, this I'm is, just, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to. No, no, an Bill. The question. Is um, that, no. How much? How much? Were you? Follow, um, did you follow the whole merger? Bill, no, no. I, I don't know how to do this, but, okay. but this okay, is okay, a single okay. question. Let okay. these people. Okay, go ahead. Okay, treat them respectfully and answer the question. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's my understanding. Is to verify that the revenue is coming in, and it's being spent, and the way that uh, appropriately on these projects that the engineer's report has. has okay. Offered. Thank you. Well, I forgot to mention I have a certificate in basic accounting and bookkeeping <clears throat> from Career College. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody else like to answer? Okay. So I went to the meeting, I think, when Michael Freitas, I don't know how to say that, but Freitas. Freitas. Um, when they presented this to Lompico, um, I think um, your name is on 
love it. <laughs> so, I mean, I've just, I've had this since then. I don't know how many years ago that was, maybe four. Um, so I've been familiar with the report and, you know, the projects. Um, I like it because, you know, when I got it, I was new to the community and it had maps in it. And I actually used those for another project. Um, so I've, you know, had this, you know, and I've referred to it over time also. I was at the last late off meeting um, and I looked over, you know, the progress that was being made in the spreadsheets that were presented at that meeting as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I will be completely honest, I'm not very familiar with everything you outlined. I have two small children, full-time job, house, so um, my, base, my basic understanding is that we have funds earmarked to go towards the infrastructure in Lompico and building that infrastructure up and improving it so that we can have water for uh, a long time. Thank you. So I think the question is, how much time have you put into understanding the engineering report and what's required of LADOC and what's required of the merger, is that correct? Correct. Um, 110% of my time has been spent on it. Um, I've been to almost every LADOC meeting. I have been to every merger meeting, information meeting. I have organized meetings to explain how to do the merger. I've worked on a committee that was to explain how to do the merger. And I have helped facilitate and add to a website that was set up that was, by the way, commended by many, many government agencies and used as a link to help other people understand what the merger is about, what the money is for why these particular projects were chosen. And um, I, I love thinking about all of this and I really would be excited to be able to explain it to other people. And, and I totally appreciate John's answer because boy, that's who we want to talk to. We want to get that information out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Those were, Mark's question was my primary one. Um, because that's really what we're looking for, is whether they're connected to what the community wants, I think. Um, I have comments, but I'll hold this off and have questions you're finished. Okay. Um, I guess I have, you know, um, this has been a difficult time getting to this point, okay, in some sense, you know, because there's a grand jury re uh, report out there and there's a response to the grand jury report. And the district has put a lot of time into and thinking about how to respond to the grand jury report. So I would like, um, you know, you know and, and we're gonna be continuing that process for, um, well, in, mostly for as soon as possible within six months, but some things will take longer to do than that. Um, so I'd like to get a feeling for whether you're comfortable with what, okay, or if you're not comfortable with it, whether you're willing to work with the process that the district has outlined for getting uh, LADOC running. So, um, you know, there's certain things about this that are um, a little bit, um, you know, ha has had discussion about them, um, about, you know, how much of the, whether engineering, the timeline of implementation of projects and things like that, you know, or something that should be discussed at LADOC. And you know, there's part of the grand jury response that says that this should come uh, to the engineering committee, for example. So, if you've thought about these things, I would appreciate your thoughts on, you know, how you would work with the, with what has gone before, and with the district and um, and your community as far as okay, um, how you'd be going forward. So, would anybody like to maybe respond to that? It's a difficult question, I know. <laughs> grand jury report and also the district response to the grand jury report. Um, I see the role of LADOC as, you know, looking over the expenses, um, you know, how much money has been brought in from the assessment and where that money has gone to. 
um, and you know, communicating that information um, to the community um, in a transparent way, um, in a reliable way. Um, and but as far as you know, let on <coughs> is not project managers or you know to be micromanaging the implementation of you know what goes when and where and how and and that type of thing. I think you know it's it's our responsibility to pay attention to the finances and the money coming in and how it is being spent, and that's our primary responsibility. Thank you. Um, I think I saw you make a gesture. Yeah, Jenny gave me a brief overview of what my responsibilities would be, and I just understood it as being uh, given spreadsheets and doing the arithmetic and making sure everything checks out. And I don't really want to do anything broader than that. I'm not interested in anything else. I feel like I can do that. And as far as communicating to the community, I've heard I'm, uh, I'm happy to talk to people at meetings explain things if I can. I really like the idea of a, a website that, that makes sense that everyone can uh, participate by going online and, and seeing what's being done. Seeing if everything is uh, being done as it should be. So, that's all. Thank you. Anybody else? And there's not an obligation to, so, but... Um, it's a welcome. Would anybody else like to respond to this? Could you repeat the, your question again? Probably not. Okay. <laughs> um, um, basically, a question regarding um, the uh, the grant. The fact noted the fact that there's a grand jury report out there. There's a grand jury response to that, and if you felt comfortable working with the district's grand jury response to that report. And in particular, I mentioned a couple, well, at least one thing, which was, uh, that, for example, you know, the management of projects would be referred to the engineering committee. Well, I think that's probably the crux of your question. Is, is there going to be a separation between projects and the finances? To a certain extent, the projects are integral to the Lattle Committee understanding the projects and being able to report to the community about the projects. We had a really good discussion, as I said, with the um, manager and the finance manager about what what would be important in, information to include. Not engineering, not planning. But when I looked at on committee oversight uh, best practices, definitely they say, and I know you're not adopting it now, but I think it will be something to consider. For best practices for bond oversight committees, they do have a very big overview of the projects, of the project's timelines, of the bid process of knowing that it's being done correctly. Um, again, not the planning part of it, but the overview part of it, and certainly a timeline. But I also understand you're not ready for that, and I'm willing to work within the constraints of the grand jury response until that's fixed. Thank you. Um, so come back, okay, if you have a question, but, or you can close that questioning and come back for some discussion, and, and then we can implement maybe some sort of process of getting to a consensus. So I'll open it up to the directors for any comments. Okay. Well, first off, I just want to make a comment. I like the diversity. It's so nice to see somebody who's a lot younger than me, because it's hard to get people who have families um, to participate, and it's, it's so we understand why we don't have a lot of younger people participating, but it's especially important, I think, to get people with children who are focused on different things because they represent an important part of the diversity in the community. So um, I know it's harder to get people in that demographic, um, but I certainly appreciate um, your participation, your, your interest, because I think that's important. Um, I, I do think that the, the one thing that came up when um, talking about the, the, the scope of, of the, the committee, the expectation of the applicants is, you know, developing a, a more, an expanded charter um, for the committee. The, the language of that 
it's a bit tricky at the moment, but um, I see, you know, my vision of this is an oversight committee. It's not project management. It's not micromanaging. It's because that, of course, we have staff for, but we also have the engineering committee. So I appreciate your, your question because that sort of highlighted it for me. Um, so I think we do have multiple committees within the within the uh, water district. And a lot of this will feed into LADOC because it's going to be a little bit of all these different, it's going to be some environmental issues, it's going to be some um, construction and engineering, it's going to be some finance, obviously, but I think their primary goal, their primary charter is always going to be financial because that's what the assessment district is about, is the actual money that residents are assessed. So I, I see that even with the language of the, the charter not developed yet in full, that that's what I'm looking at when I'm looking at candidates, is something that's going to be prim primarily financial oversight, but with, you know, pieces of the other parts of the process in their purview as well. Um. Um, okay, well, Bill, okay. I, I need to learn to look um, both directions. I really like the idea that um, uh, Mr. Bob Fultz brought out that we, we, there's going to be some other spots, you know, I brought, you, there, there's, I believe um, some of you are a really good fit for the LADOC, but, you know, I'd really like to entertain the thought of just, you know, putting your talents, I think some of, when I, from what I heard, some of your talents might be better suited over um, in, one, in one of the other committees, so I, I mean, I'm just really, I'm very happy that you are, you know, volunteering um, and coming down here and, and, and letting us know um, exactly what you want. But um, if, for, if for, for whatever reason you don't get on the committee tonight, or really, because I think tonight we can only decide on LADOC. It, it's the only one that's on the agenda. But next month we need somebody on the engineering committee, correct? And then we also, um, and the, um, the, um, the budget, and, well, I'm not, anyway. But it can't happen. It can't happen that tonight. So if you do not get on the committee tonight, I just really hope that you, you stay on and get on one of the other committees. And that's the only thing that I want to say. Thank you. Okay. Margaret, I have nothing further to add, but I would make a motion for one appointment if that's how you want to start this. Well, I'm putting. Um, it might work that way. What I was suggesting, and it doesn't have to be this way, is that um, we. You would actually make. Um, Three suggestions. You're the first in the list that you would tell three, okay. and then I'll go to then I'm the next person on the list, um, and then go to you, and then go to Jean. If that's comfortable with everybody, then I think that's a good way to go through it. Okay. Okay. I would um, move that the following three individuals are appointed to the ladder: uh, Dennis Lynch, John Wright, and Jenny Gomez. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will, um, I'll follow in that. Okay, that's my, um, those are my choices also. And Bill? Uh, I'm uh, Deborah Lowen, Jenny Gomez, and Mr. John Wright. Okay. I'm gonna go with Jenny, Dennis, and John. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So, um, based upon that, um, I will make a motion that we approve, or, uh, that we um, accept as uh, onto the LADOC committee the three applicants, Jenny Gomez, Dennis Lynch, and John Wright. Second. Do I have a second? Okay. Is there any further discussion at this point? I don't hear any. So, Holly, would you um, give us a roll call vote on this? Absolutely. Director Bruce? Yes. Jimmy Dempster. Director Ratcliffe? Yes. President Bothman? Yes. And Director Smallman? No. Okay. Um, so, at, uh, so welcome of the three of you. And I appreciate um, everybody who applied, uh, especially those who came. And 
you're right, there are other appointments available for other committees, so that's a good possibility. Um, so, appreciate people being here tonight. And I don't think there's anything else. Um, informality of this, so these are the appointments. Would you like, oh yes, you would, um, yes, I'd like to go to staff just first. Just in our first meeting in October. Um, Stephanie Hill, Director of Finance, and Business Manager, and myself will be attending the meeting as support staff. Um, we'll put out the first agenda here soon. Uh, the first meeting will be discussing the Charter, Brown Act training, uh, selecting committee chair, the grand jury report, and committee activities. Um, those of you who are not selected, I really want to thank you for your interest, and I hope and encourage you to attend the meetings and uh, be part of the discussion. And staff will supply you the same information that we supply everybody else, of course. Your input will be very valuable to the committee. That, that's what I had to talk with. Okay. What was the date? Oh, what was, um, I didn't catch the date that you said. You said a. Mid October. Pardon? Mid October. Mid October. Okay. Anticipated. Okay. To be determined by people's availability yeah. and et cetera. Okay. Yes. I, I have a question. I don't know if this, maybe I can ask uh, counsel about this. Is one of the comments that was brought up during um, public comment was regarding the applicability of the Matty Act and our decision to defer the vote until today. Um, I wondered if that would, if we could respond to that. Are we ready to, or do you, okay? Um, and I don't remember mentioning it this evening, but. Um. Um, that that is a correct point. Um, I looked at the Matty Act for the first time during the meeting um, and only saw a portion of it. Um, it was not an act I was familiar with and I thought somebody had brought something to my attention that I hadn't previously been aware of and I interpreted it on the spot. Um, and it wasn't until about a week later that I realized what Mr. Holloway um, expressed during the meeting, which is that it does not, it, although it says local agencies in the portion that I was interpreting, it's specially defined to apply to counties and cities, which is not typically how we understand it's local agencies. So I have an incorrect interpretation on the fly of the statute that we use in the process of And I'll say that uh, um, having heard this from you, I would rather uh, postpone something based, okay, uh, you know, on the principle of better to, you know, not make a mistake, okay, you know, to solve your problem and not make a mistake in the process of getting to that. So um, we've all learned something about the Matty Act now, and uh, we'll know going forward. Thank you for clarification. Back and forth with them, and I am happy to announce that we have everything resolved, and as of this afternoon, that everything has been submitted, you as Fish and Wildlife is happy with our mitigation measures, so we are able to say, and I'm sorry, I apologize for a typo on here, that NEPA has been completed which is basically the national environmental regulations that we had to meet for this. Since this is federal funding, we have to comply with NEPA. We do still have to comply with CEQA, but not, um, not as far as this application package goes. So the next steps are, um, USDA is, gonna, is actually looking at the whole application, making sure that everything's in order. We do know that we have to submit a revised application tomorrow with all those mitigation measures. So um, one of my coworkers actually revised it this evening. So tomorrow morning we should be able to hit submit for the last time on this application package. Then we're just gonna wait on approval from USDA. And again, that application package does not obligate the district to any funding. It is simply an application package. So after that, once USDA approves it, it'll come back to the board with the full contract and all the information, and then the board will make the decision on how they want to move forward on that. And then lastly, to complete the projects, we will have to finish the CEQA process, so we're still doing that in parallel, so that pretty much by the time all the funding's in place and we're going to go on all the projects, all the environmental will be complete, both from a national standpoint and California. And last, since this was information only, there is no recommended action by the board of directors on this item. Okay. Thank you. Um, any public comment on this? One um, question I have for you, public comment. Oh. We're 8.8 .8 million now, and we 
we originally started out at a much lower figure for our projects. And the public has asked, you know, how do we get to 8.8 .8 million from where we were originally? Maybe you can touch base on that. Absolutely. So when we started this process, we started the conversation a year ago. We formally started the process last <coughs> December when we were joining the PDR. When we started talking with USDA, we had a list of projects that were based on the CIP and we took the top ranked ones. Once we got into the process with USDA, there were certain ones that were applicable and we revised our project list. So you've seen some numbers in the current. And then what happened is USDA, if you recall, had a surplus of money this year. So they asked us to hurry up and expedite all of this. So there was a rush to hire an environmental firm. There was a rush to um, get everything done by certain deadlines. And because of that, any of the projects that were environmentally complex, we had to remove and replace. So our project list now is very different from the place where we started, which was at about $5 million. Also as part of this process, as part of the PER, we had to redo cost estimates for the final project list with 2018 numbers and also projecting forward what it's gonna cost in construction years. So when you're talking $8.25 million, some of that is actually saying, well, we're gonna construct this in two years and we have to predict what the construction environment's gonna be for that. So you have very up-to-date cost estimates, or the cost estimates we started with before were a few years out of date. So the, the biggest issue is that the project has completely changed from when we started with five million, and that was due to environmental. Okay. Um, yeah, there's one, well, there's one item in the agenda where anyway, it's a request for uh, $50,000 for on call is needed. Is that the next, or is that the same? That's a separate item. That's the next item, also. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. I've got a question of the one that comes to doing the sequel. I know that the USDA has some leverage when we go to the agencies to get, you know, answers. Does that help us with CEQA as well? Um, a lot of CEQA and NEPA overlap. They've been extremely helpful with SHPO and US Fish and Wildlife. Things that processes that typically take six months were done in weeks. So, regardless, this is an environmental from an environmental process. This has been a complete win. Okay, nice to know. I guess I have, I have one question. Um, I think we worked pretty hard to get pretty simple environmental okay um, projects in this that would not require um, a heavy lift on permitting. Um, so I heard you say that you, the, the project list has changed because of that. But I guess if one project or multiple projects still have a red legged frog issues on them, or yes, okay. there are two that have the red legged frog, and um, I think there may be a difference of opinion of whether there actually is red legged frog there. But we had to go with what Fish and Wildlife said. So we originally said there should be no impact, and Fish and Wildlife came back and said. So we worked it out though with them. They were actually, I think, pretty reasonable, and we were able to come to a compromise in a very short amount of time. So. Okay. Good. Um, Marvin, uh, anything? Okay. Um, and if staff doesn't, any more comments on it? No. Okay. Uh, then public on this item. Anybody like to speak? Uh, Mr. Ferris, could you? Because others have. Okay. You, actually. <laughs> oh, no, I was just, um, I was trying to remember who had asked that uh, people come to the, le uh, to the lectern, so. Lou Ferris Helton, since the number of projects has changed and the dollar value has changed, do you have a list of what exact projects the 8.2 million entails? Yes, I do. Can you share that with us? Um, you know what, yeah, let me get it on. Uh, yeah, no, sure, sure. So I can send it to Mr. Ferris in the morning. Okay. 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 I can send it to you in the morning, I have it. Okay. I gave that presentation at the last meeting, yeah. actually. But other people might be interested, too, in just saying. I do believe it's on the website. Um, it, it is on the website? The, the presentation should have been submitted, because I presented it at the last meeting. So it should yeah. have been, the slides should, should be. have been submitted. I'll double check. Okay. And send him a link um, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, any other public comment on this? Um, Ms. Lowen? Yeah, um, I'll just ask from here. So. When do you anticipate you're going to turn it in tomorrow? How long do you anticipate before you get any kind of response back to the state? Um, they will not give me a solid answer. So um, what I have heard, I had a conversation with USDA this afternoon. Once it gets submitted, it actually has to go to Washington, D.C. for approval. 
So the, their fiscal year ends at the end of September. They, we've been on the list for a very long time, and we are very lucky that USDA locally is advocating for us. So we are hoping to find out soon in the beginning of October. We have been told that if we do not make this round of funding, we are first in line for the next round of funding. So as soon as federal funds are allocated, which they expect to be in November, then we would find out then that we got approved. And we're not expecting, we are expecting to be approved. So the difference would be six months, maybe two months as to when the contract comes back to the board. Okay. okay. I saw another hand up. Okay. Mr. Foltz. Just a couple of quick questions up the table to answer them. What interest rate did you use to calculate the bridge line? I don't know that number off the top of my head. It's like four to five. Four to five. Yeah, I think so. And <laughs> over what time period? So the cons because this has to get. We don't get the money until all the projects are done. Yeah, roughly like three years, and it was estimated to be somewhere around the six and a half million need. Great, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else? I don't see anybody else, so um, come back to the board, but there's no, um, no, action, no action to be taken. Information at the board and public. Okay. And I think we've had our bite at it, right? Anybody? Okay. Um, let's move on to um, item 9E, um, which is what you were mentioning here, um, Bill, which is discussion and possible action regarding a request for an increase of $50,000 in current on-call as needed engineering contract with WSC Engineering. And staff is uh, in May uh, 217. Uh, 2017, the board awarded an on-call as-needed engineering contract to WSC Engineering, which is attached in your, in your packet, not to exceed the price of $60,000. Uh, the intent was to provide engineering service to the district for small or emergency pro projects without initiating uh, an RFP, a request for proposal, every time uh, services are needed, covered under this contract, with pursuant of funding options and front-end documents for the past simple well, portion of the Bear Creek Road pipeline, project, the Highway 9 storm repairs uh, pipeline project, and extension of staff services. In November 2017, the board awarded an amendment of 20000 in order to continue work as needed items, including finishing design and coordinating with Caltrans for the Highway 9 storm repair pipeline project and funding support. Staff is requesting an extension to the current on-call as needed contract the district has with WSC. The date this contract has been very effective in providing critical engineering services for emergency and high priority projects to the district. Some of the projects that we're working on now and continuing are going to be created standard drawings for fire hydrants, water service, and gatehouse. We, our service, uh, our standard drawings are very old. They don't uh, reflect today's uh, materials that we're using and we supply those to uh, contractors for bidding for install, such as you have an agreement tonight for a new fire hydrant and, and there's other um, agreements forthcoming. Uh, we're going to be writing an RFP for the line tank access road and support design, which uh, was from what, two years ago, uh, slide of the line tank. We finally got the engineering report back. And now the next step is to move ahead with an RFP for repairs. And we have other various projects on an on-call. We, um, we will be working with WSC on the uh, Air Creek Estates uh, RFP. Um, this is an important contract, and uh, we have request the board to increase $50,000. Kirsten is here, and she is with WSC um, to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you. Okay. Um. Go to uh, public first. Any questions um, for anybody in the public or comments? Uh, Mr. Fultz? I, th I think this is, <clears throat> comes in more of a uh, policy question relative to how to hire outside contractors. I know even Mr. Hammer, a former board member, had some concerns about 
the number of sort of negated uh, type contracts that are being led. And I'm not saying that WSC doesn't do a fine job. It's just there's two considerations here. One is, I think we have a lot of eggs in one basket, and sometimes supplier diversity actually can help with that in terms of being able to pick up um, loads here and there. And the other is, periodically, you just need to check the rates. Um, and that's can only be done really through a, a different kind of process than a window of process. At some point, um, obviously tonight it's going to pass, but at some point I think it would be prudent for the board to consider um, a different approach on some of these contracts. Um, we've, we've had a lot of no-bid uh, contracts over the last year, year and a half or so. I think driven a lot by the former general manager, but I'd hate to see that continue uh, into the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll ask for any other public comments before we come back to any responses or board discussion. I don't see anybody wanting to say anything to this. Um, would you like to? Okay. No, just one important thing I left out that uh, WSC is also getting the, uh, the APRBs out the bid. Okay. They're finishing up on uh, the request for proposal on the construction of the LMP going for APRBs. Very okay. important. Yes, very good. Okay. Um, Thank you. And any other, um, Bill? Um, well, I know this district, you know, I mean, um, as an engineer, has um, quite a bit of engineering workload, you know, to to do, to, you know, I, just as an engineer, I, can, I know that there's a lot of um, work <laughs> available. And, you know, before we had some in staff, um, engineers working we, and you know in the future maybe we you know might consider actually having more engineers but at the present time
you know, I believe that we, you know, we, I don't want to throw, uh, you know, we need to proceed with, um, you know, I believe WSC has been doing a, a great job up to now, and that we need to, um, uh, to, uh, you know, make sure that we keep moving forward with all the infrastructure improvement projects, in my opinion. And so, I, you know, I, I, you know, I think this is a good thing. And um, but, you know, towards the future, yes, I, I understand that thing about bidding contracts. But you have to realize you have to go through a big process. Uh, and, and and I understand the um, concern. And I think that when when at, at this time, I, you know, I don't think it is. But in the future, I think we we should actually consider getting you know public bids and and. Um, for the project, so I understand that uh, Director Hammer's concern in that regard. But uh, uh, anyway, so I, I think I don't, or I don't really have an issue with this fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any other? Um, um, I agree. We're in a time of transition at the moment, um, and I think it's good to keep this continuity and keep this stuff moving at the time, at this current time, looking at this someplace down the road as to whether, I mean, that is always, okay, something to be revisited at some point in the future, but not this evening. Um, so um, if there's um, any other board discussion, then I would um, entertain a motion. The extension for on call as needed engineering contract with WSC engineering in the amount of $50,000. second. Okay. Um, I think we could probably do this on a uh, voice vote. Um, all those in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, um, this passes four to zero um, with one person absent. Pardon? Thank you. Pearson. Pearson. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, let's um, continue. So the next item, item 9F, on unfinished business, is the Board of Directors meetings rescheduled. Um, this seems pretty... Okay. So um, on July 19th, the Board of Directors voted in favor of moving the location of the board meetings previously scheduled for the Boulder Creek Fire Station to the Zianti Fire Station. We were not able to hold the August 16th meeting at the Zianti Fire Station because the Zianti Board of Directors must approve all meetings at the station, and they were not going to meet until after that date of August 16th. We were approved for the November Board of uh, Directors meeting, but now we have scheduled a public hearing for the Bear Creek Estates Wastewater Prop 218 on that date. So the Bear Creek Estates customers requested that the meeting be held closer to Boulder Creek. Uh, we are now suggesting and requesting that the October 18th Board of Directors meeting be held at the Zianti Fire Station. I was hoping I would have heard from them by now, and I haven't heard uh, from Chief Stipes as of today, but I'm expecting that that should not be a problem, and I'm hoping that uh, we can move that October 18th. Board of Directors meeting to Zianni Fire Station, and then the um, November Board of Directors meeting will be held at um, the uh, Ops Building across the street, our regular board meeting, um, meeting room. Okay. Um, I'll go to the public first on this in case it affects anybody who was expecting that um, at a particular time. Ms. Gomez. Thank you for the Zianni Fire Station. Okay, Mr. Holloway. Uh, this board used to meet twice a month. The big meetings go kind of long. Uh, I can specifically remember Brian Lee saying that he wanted to spend more time with his family. And I think that goal has been achieved. I think you should go back to two meetings a month so you can uh, get more work done and, and people won't be exhausted at the end. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to comment on this? Okay, I'll bring it back here. Um, and I'll comment on this. I uh, basically agree. I think there would be good occasions in which we could be having two meetings a month, and we should consider that. Oh, I agree. Okay. And work out the details of uh, the content of those may be appropriate for a heavy, okay, uh, uh, 
different natures for the two. So any uh, other board discussion on this? Um, no. Okay. Um, I will move that the, the meeting times be uh, changed as they are in this. Uh, perhaps um, is there could be the proviso if we cannot get the the place in Zanetti, it would just come back to Boulder Creek as a fallback position. Okay, so hopefully we can do that there. Um, okay, so I would do. I would move that it be held. Okay, as the meetings be rescheduled as this with the provision that the uh, other meeting, if it cannot uh, take place in Zanetti, would be back in Boulder Creek. Second. Okay. Um, any discussion? So let's do a voice vote on that. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Um, let's move on to uh, the next item on the agenda. So um, we can move to new business. So the first item on this is the San Lorenzo Valley Habitat Restoration Program, discussion of possible action by the board regarding the SLV Habitat Restoration Program presented by Linda Skeff. So I believe staff would like to. Pardon? Okay. So I'll just speak briefly. Um, we do have Okay. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, um, I've had a suggestion that we take a um, five-minute recess. Um, we we've, we've got quite a few other items. We're going through them fairly quickly, but let's take a five-minute recess and reconvene at eight thirty. Okay. We're reconvening. Um, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District's Board of Directors meeting at just a minute past the anticipated time, 831. We were discussing the San Lorenzo Valley Habitat Restoration Program. Um, have you completed your? I had pretty much completed what I was going to say. Okay. Um, I, I have recommended that we sponsor that and that we look at Okay. Um, before I go to the public for comment on this, I um, um, what are the obligations of an annual sponsorship? Okay, ship. So there's one-time donations. You said a thousand dollars. Is that as an annual sponsorship, or is that a, essentially a one-time donation? Okay, so this is no long-term ob obligation. Okay, um, any other? May I, <coughs> excuse me, chime in with a comment regarding the AmeriCorps um, service and the value of, that the, this program provides to this cadre of young professionals. It's, a, it's a very much like our watershed education grants in that it exposes young professionals um, to great work experience, to great community engagement experience, and um, provides a great resource for 
you know, perhaps bench for us in the future, and it gets a lot of valuable service for the community done for very little money. Okay. And I just want to make another weird comment about turbidity after the film. Um, one of the other things they really focus on is erosion control around all their projects and using them as a model for homeowners who are interested in doing That's one of their goals is that people who own private property could perhaps look at some of the work that's been done by this program and get ideas for managing their own property. And one of their big things is erosion control through mulching and that kind of thing. So I thought that's also some sort of ties into some of the projects they've completed in the past years, which I thought were useful. Specifically here in Highland Park, and I think up in uh, Garaham or uh, Park mm -hmm. as well. And I believe they did some work at Quail Hollow also. No, I, I know, and then I know, I know um, a lot of her work um, that she's done, um, uh, it's just great. And so, I mean, this is <coughs> money well spent. <laughs> And I agree. I think uh, you do get okay a lot of work done for a relatively small amount of money, and um, these are good things to support. So, but anybody in the public like to comment on this? I don't see anybody wanting to comment on this one. Right. Well, you okay? You're just as important now as you were earlier. Um, so, with no public comment on this, um, do I hear? Um, Okay, and um, do we have some consensus on an amount? A um, thousand? I, I, think, by the way, I, mean, I just think to keep it at a thousand if it turns out to be, I don't know. Okay. I think a thousand is fine. Okay, do I hear a motion to this effect? And would we support the uh, San Luis Valley Restoration uh, Program with a donation of a thousand dollars? Okay, I'll second that. And I think we can do this on a voice vote. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, hearing none, it passes four to zero with uh, one director absent. So let's move on to item 10B, which is the uh, Olympia Mitigation Reserve Endowment. So um, I think this would be good for staff to introduce. So the reserve, well, we'll or either of you. Okay. Uh, so as you know, we have to create an endowment as part of our land trust. Uh, this is from the Budget and Finance Committee, I believe twice, uh, for sure at least once, where we were recommending the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County um, to fund the endowment. Uh, the gentleman from there did come and do a presentation on it. Uh, it was pretty well received that, A, there's not a whole lot of them, them out there. We like that they were local. Um, we did work with him on, you know, it's not free. I mean, the, the fee that, that they presented was about one and a half percent. Their returns were, were are, are well. Um, they did do a scale fee. So depending on how much we have in the fund, the fee can go from um, one and a half to one and a quarter down to one percent. So over time, you know, if the fund continues to grow, uh, the management fee can go down. They do offer two different funds that we need to select from tonight is the second part of this. Um, I recommend that the board select a socially responsible long-term pool as a fund for agreement. They included, I included some of the pamphlets that they have in that, but I feel it goes in line with the district's um, atmosphere of giving back to the community they invest in socially wise things to avoid controversial items such as, you know, alcohol, tobacco. So they invest in more environmental friendly, social responsible uh, type of investments. Okay. Um, I guess I have one question. I didn't see a cumulative number for the return over the period for which the graph was. Maybe it's in there someplace, but it seems like I remember from Mr. Lee's presentation that the socially responsible one was not a, much different from the long-term portfolio. It's not much different. I mean, it's in the market, so, but it, it has been <coughs> responding better. It's been having less volatility. Um, okay. You know, but it's, it's a, 
invested in perpetuity. The district is not able to invest in perpetuity the way that uh, non-wasting endowment is intended to be. Um, you know, this is this is I think the best fit for the district to be able to gain the types of reserves that are going around the habitat management thing. Okay. Um, any other questions? Um, fully funded with the entire mitigation bank, do we know how much might be? Would you get into the lower, I mean, the lower fees areas eventually? Well, assuming we keep the mitigation area at 6.7 acres, it would be right. fully funded at or, or just under 850000 Okay. That would generate, I believe, I did some calculations, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's okay. roughly Okay. Okay. Um, any other discussion? I, I appreciate the opportunity to select a socially responsible investment pool. Thank okay. you. I do too. Um, With less volatility. Okay. <laughs> Although 2008 was volatile, no matter how you cut it. <laughs> um, okay. Do I hear a motion? Um, I, did I miss public comment? Well, thank you for reminding me. It, always do that, please. So the alternatives you looked at, what were the one-year, five-year, and ten-year returns for both the social fund and the alternatives? Uh, they have it all listed out for what their... Yeah, no, part of it is getting it on. Returns are... Yeah, no, the returns are... Oh, yeah, they have their different... Like, it's in the packet, I think, mean, they have all their different returns. Yeah, I understand. Okay. He wants to put a record. Which one it is on there for that one? They, they have the. Well, the one we're selecting versus the alternative that wasn't that way, might have a higher return. He pointed out which one it was because they have the two long term. Well, um, this particular investment with the Community Foundation is basically a Morgan Stanley uh, run investment. Uh, I spent years trying to extricate this district from a uh, brokerage account with Morgan Stanley. Uh, one and a half percent, when, when uh, you had committee meetings, I said, even if I had chosen this for my career path, to uh, be a financial professional and make investment decisions for people, I could not in good conscience take more than 1%. Um, so 1.5%, I think is too steep. Uh, Randall Brown used to say, when there's only one alternative, I start looking for other alternatives. And that's exactly what this is. This is one alternative in this county. Um, two years ago, I was involved in a uh, political campaign against Measure Q. Measure Q was financed by the Cabrillo College Foundation to the tune of $250,000. We had $5,000 against it, and we beat it. 
Now, I'm working on against Measure H. The Community Foundation has been quoted in the Sentinel. They're going to spend $300,000 backing uh, Measure H. So this is what your 1.5% is going to go for. It's going to be selling us, selling us the voters, on uh, new taxes. Um, and I, frankly, I don't think that you can make housing more affordable by putting a tax on everybody's house. That's absurd. So that's what the Community Foundation stands for. Uh, there needs to be an alternative, and you have not figured out what it is. You've spent months looking at this, you have no alternatives. You're going with a monopoly. This is the wrong thing to do. You've made this mistake with Morgan Stanley before. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, seeing two thirds. So, um, close out orals and uh, come back to the board. Any other? Uh, so anyway, this thing, <coughs> the fiscal impact is twenty five thousand, right? And then so, but you're saying that we're going to get that we get that money back and more than, from the thing, or is it going to? It's twenty five thousand to start an endowment fund okay. with them. Okay. We have we're, we have to follow. So the probation tank uh, mitigation alone, I believe, is about a hundred. Yeah, one hundred eighteen somewhere around that thousand that we have to fund into this fund. So over, okay. I mean, it's going to continue to grow upwards of that eight hundred, roughly eight hundred thousand dollar, over time as we do these projects. We pay into our own okay. land bank to where we're at least earning interest on it versus if we were to just go and have to pay to someone else's money where we just don't see any benefit of that. Okay. Okay. Um, Bruce. Um, <clears throat> question um, with regard to Mr. Holloway's question. In your examination of how to set up uh, an endowment, did you look at any other institutions? Were any other available? Um, that were Responsive. I forgot the name of the other company. It was not local. Um, they didn't really seem receptive to it. We didn't get to the point of them giving me different rates and stuff like that. But from other people that had used the community foundation, they said they, you know, it, it, they were comparable. Um, so a lot of it was a lot of it was deemed, you know, it was a look at other agencies. There's not a whole lot of places doing doing this, um, they do seem to be in a niche where they are charging roughly the same, you know, similar rates like this. And so the attractiveness was that this was a local, a local option. Okay. Um, any other? Um, I don't either really. Um, I, do I interpret this correctly that um, the seven year return on of the two funds that are in here is 6.78 and 7.18%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, I mean, they, they perform fairly oh. similar. Um, this one is happening to be performing better than, than the socially, yeah, than, than their regular long term. I thought the socially responsible aspect of it, you know, also definitely had um, some merit. Some value to yeah. that. Right. Okay. Um, any other board discussion? Anybody want to make a motion? <coughs> there will be two actions. Oh. The, the agreement's really long. It right? is. I know. I'm sitting here <laughs> scrolling up right. I knew that they had that. I had the slides. Yeah, there, I, I, the chart I, I, at some point. I didn't read through the um, oh, okay. Oh, we need to make the choice. Okay, of which fund. To, it's the middle. Which one, right? Do you recommend the social? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we could do a two-part. Oh, I'm okay. So it would be uh, President Bachman that would be the person ultimately signing it. So we're looking to have uh, to approve the endowment agreement and to select the socially responsible long term pool as the fund for the year. Would there be any value in making those as separate motions or just put them together? They could be done together. Okay. Um, I will make the motion that the board approve the Community Foundation Santa Cruz County Agency Endowment Fund Agreement for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District Olympia Wellfield Habitat Set Aside Endowment Fund. And okay, well that's a okay. And um, 
that we select the socially responsible long-term pool as the fund for the agreement. Second. Okay. Any further board discussion? None. Um, then I'll call this one for a roll call. I mean, for a voice vote also. Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, passes four to zero. Um, let's um, move on to 10C, which is uh, proposed resolution number seven of 1819 to update the district's policies and procedures for conducting Proposition 218 proceedings. Is there a copy for the public? Pardon? Is there a copy for the public? Okay. Um, uh, sure, please. Um, in connection with the upcoming uh, proposed rate uh, increase for Bear Creek Estates, I took a look at the district's uh, rules and regulations related to Proposition 218 proceedings. Um, there were some cleanup changes that were desirable. Um, a lot of regulations simply tracked the language of 218 and some of the uh, laws that implement 218. So it's a little bit unnecessary, but in the places where it deviates from the exact language of the law, and in some cases, um, those deviations are helpful in directing the, the district's process. In other cases, they actually deviate from 218 and the, the relevant law in ways that really shouldn't be embedded in the district's regulations. There's also places towards the end of the regulations where they become repetitive and start to conflate uh, some of the Article 13D, Section 4 processes with Section 6, conflating protests with ballots. And so I proposed a set of changes to just clean up those issues so that the district's regulations can be um, more cleanly implemented as they're written. For future 218 processes. Okay. Um, one of the things I noted that one subsection was deleted in its entirety, and is that a is that a something that's extremely unlikely for us to ever use, or why was that? Um, yeah, the, the reason for the deletion is that toward the end of the regulations is where they became um, sort of repetitive. There were sections that repeated prior sections, um, and in addition, it, the regulations shifted from talking about protest to ballots, which right. is a section four concept instead of a section six concept, making them relatively useless as written. Right. So I did it. Okay. okay. Um, any other board discussion before we go to public comment on this? Um, I don't hear anybody, so public comment? Yeah, um, gosh, you know, this looks like the sort of thing that you talk about endlessly in an administration committee, and I'm surprised that you just spring it on us, you know, with no committee discussion at all. Um, I sent an email to the administration committee months ago, and um, I said, you know, one of the things that's uh, the matter with this whole section is that it uh, continuously refers to Roman numeral 12 when this is all about Proposition 13, which is Article 13 of the California Constitution, so it's Roman numeral 13. I actually talked to some people last year that wanted to sue the district because they thought that the district had sent out a bunch of stuff that improperly referred to Article 12 of the state constitution, and that made this entire uh, process last year illegal. Well, I don't agree with their point of view, but I do think that it's a trivial change to go through here and, and change it. Roman numeral 12 to Roman numeral 13. And I emailed the administration committee months ago. So what do you do when somebody emails you? You just bury it. You know, you just bury it. And now you've got your attorney, re you know, revising six pages of stuff, and, but that's not one thing you're going to do. No, no, no. We're going to still be talking about it more as well, but the Constitution great. Um, the main thing that people get confused about with Prop 2, 218, and I've seen this, you know, for at least five years, is um, when is there required a ballot, and when is there only required a protest, a no. Um, I think somebody wrote a letter just a few weeks ago 
complaining about this, saying, why don't we count the yes votes? Well, it's very clearly stated in Article 13. And you referred to Section 4, Section 6. And I think that's probably what E and F are here for. One is trying to talk about a proceeding under Section either 4 or 6. And the other one is probably trying to talk about a proceeding under the other one. Um, so one of those proceedings is about assessments, which is kind of like what happened with Long Pico. They're paying an assessment. They voted. They voted yes, no. Uh, but when we do a water rate increase, we don't usually vote yes. We only vote no. Um, and there are two kinds of proceedings, and they're both described in the California Constitution, which you don't even mention the right article here. So I don't even know what to say about this from head to toe. Um, I think you ought to work on it more. Any other public comment? Okay, none. Um, we need to, it would be good to have this passed this evening um, so that we can address the next item on the agenda. Is that correct? It doesn't need to be done tonight. If, it, if there are concerns, it could, the easiest thing to do would be to pass the resolution as adopted, but making with those provisions catch from uh, Article 12 um, to that should be changed to Article 13. So that could be done tonight. If mm -hmm. there is a desire for the admin committee to take a closer look at this before completing this round of cleanup, um, that's fine too. Okay. Um, any other any admin committee? I think you? it's it's a good opportunity for the members of the admin committee to take a look at it, if if not to further refine it, although there may be opportunities there, but to make sure that the members of the admin committee have had a chance to take a look at it and the public has a, a chance to be acquainted with the changes as well. So if it does not compromise the schedule moving forward with the very crazy states, I would prefer it come back for a um, minor correction and at least a, a, a brief presentation discussion at admin committee. What would you think of approving it with the provision that the Article 12, okay, um, corrections be made and come back to admin for another look? I mean, that wouldn't be part of the motion, but I mean, it would be part, we would agree to do that. Or something. Something. Seem reasonable? That it would, okay, and then, the, then it could be just a discussion item to see that we understand it, and uh, the public can comment at that time. That, that approach works, and um, I would just add that the provisions that sort of confusingly or cryptically refer to, I believe, Section 4, could be re-added at some point. They're not something the district has exercised in any recent history. They could be re-added in a way that actually makes sense, but that could be something for another day. Right. I'm, I'm a bit inclined to get some improvement done this evening. I agree. And then uh, revisit. And then it's revisited. As needed. Okay. Um, do I hear a motion? I would move approval of the changes in our Prop 218 um, process. And this would be resolution number 718-19, revisions to policies and procedures. For conducting Proposition 218 property related fees and charges proceedings with the proviso that in the future this revised policy and procedure come back to the admin committee for further discussion. Mm -hmm. And the Article 12 reference should be Article 13. Should be made Article 13. Okay. Um, I'll second that motion. Any other discussion? sense that this can be on a voice vote as well. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Let's um, move on to item 10D, the Bear Creek Estates Wastewater Rates uh, Prop 218. So um, with not many in attendance, I think this is speaks well to this item tonight. So um, we've, had, we've had multiple meetings. Um, <coughs> With the, with the customers out in Bear Creek uh, at the most recent budget and finance committee meeting. We sent them the proposal of this. Um, they all seem to be pretty well received. 
received on it. Um, originally, from the original rate, rate study, we did the full throttle proposal to them, which was doing more so um, in-kind capital replacement, building reserves, kind of you know, more so the whole kit caboodle for what the full five-year rate increase was uh, from discussions with them. It was pretty clear that you know there is a big capital need out there in the near future, and we don't know the answer to it yet because there are studies that we, that we need to we need to do. Um, the districts throttled back and did a proposed three year with certain um, benchmarks in here that we're that we're going to try that we're the, uh, deadline for when we're going to hit some of these different things. And the idea is to be able to cover the increased operating costs that you know that there have been uh, pay. Uh, there's sixty five thousand dollars built into to this to cover the study that, that is deemed necessary to figure out the capital um, and to start chipping away a little bit at their, uh, their ongoing uh, loss. This will get us to the point of three years. We should be able to have a study that we can then sit down with them and have a more realistic conversation of what the next best step is and have you know, better price estimates around different stuff like that and have a more well-informed conversation you know, in three plus years from now. Okay. Um, first go to public, any comments on this? Mr. Fultz? <coughs> It sounds like we finally have reached a decent conclusion with Bear Creek Estates. I believe this conclusion could have been reached how many months ago? The last meeting. Um, six months, whatever, well, before the last 218 process that they voted down. If the board and the general manager, well, had actually taken the time to go out and communicate with Bear Creek Estates. Um, with that general manager gone, I have no doubt that our current one is going to make it, do a fine job of that. Um, but it really goes to, I think, the board is managing the general manager. And these kinds of things, when the original proposal was to drive up the rates so fast in the first year, and even, even Brian Lee admitted at a meeting, well, you know, I didn't think it was going to pass, I just wanted to show you something. It's almost like trying to manipulate people into sticker shock to try to get some it's like you didn't have to do that. The people in Bear Creek States are all very smart people. They understand the situation. They know that money is owed. I have no doubt that they want to make sure everything gets back to um, to a, a good place. But what they don't want is they don't want to be put on yet another four-year or five-year program where they're completely ignored in terms of the longer-term solution that's needed to, to their problem. And then the 218 process comes back, and all of a sudden they get attention again. So we know this is an ongoing issue. Um, at some point, the system they have is going to have to be replaced. It's probably going to have to be a step system or some other kind of system. And so hopefully, by the end of this three year, not only do you have a study done, but you're actually further along than that. And I hope the Bear Creek Estates people hold your feet, the board's feet, to the fire so that something significant gets done rather than just sort of muddle along for the next few years. Um, so I think they've been very generous here in, in what they've agreed to, because uh, it's very easy for them to turn it down, as we know. Um, but I think the board needs to step up here and basically make sure that this process gets completed. Uh, when I toured the, the place in 2014, um, you know, I knew that this was not a solution that they that they needed to have. They needed to have something different. I think they're willing to work with the board and the district to pay for it. I think this is a great first step of trying to reestablish some of that trust. Now you need to drive it home and make sure that you don't put this in the back burner. I would actually put, I would actually exceed expectations in terms of delivery rather than just meet expectations on the conditions that are also in the agreement. It would be a great show of good faith on the board's part. <clears throat> Anybody else like to comment? I don't see any other public wanting to comment on this. Um, come back here. 
And yeah, as we move ahead, to the, our plan is to get this in front of the engineering committee to start um, fleshing out ideas and, and talking about our process. Now, Director Smallman has uh, several ideas, and we get this in front of the committee, talk about putting together the RFP so we can explore. We want to explore as many techniques as, as possible that, that, that's financially <coughs> responsible to look at and then move this ahead and come up with a with a plan. There's another um, there's uh, another agency involved here, the regional board, that's got to buy off on this because we're not pushing, kicking the can down the road, but we're taking a little bit longer probably than they would like to to correct the 50% nitrogen reduction in the II because we are under a compliance order. But with the regional board, my, my experience in the past, if you're showing good faith effort to move forward and make corrections, they usually work with you. Now, and keep in mind, this is just, uh, this increase is just the O&M that Stephanie said for them. They've got a big lift coming financially. And, you know, I don't know if possible or not, I know Stephanie is working, looking for grants, and we're looking, lifting rocks, trying to find other sources of funding. Because I don't think rates will be able to cover the, the whole program. We're rebuilding the system out there. It's going to be a heavy lift for those folks. So we've got to get creative and find money elsewhere as well. Um, we hope that uh, we, we, sh we should make these deadlines no problem and have the request for proposal made public by December 31st, 2018, award the proposal to the most qualified candidate by uh, April 30th, you know, assuming uh, qualified proposals are received. Uh, request the candidate uh, to have a complete study done by March 31st, 2020. So it appears, the, as Stephanie said, the Bear Creek people are on board, they understand, they want to work with us, but they want to be, they want, they want to know what's going on. And we can't Okay. I just want to make a, Bob, I wanted to respond to your, to your comments um, about engaging Bear Creek. We had community meetings, committee meetings, and board meetings up there. And I must say, at the first community meeting that I attended, um, it was an educational process. And it was a bit of a sticker shock. Some people didn't even know what their water bills were. Um, some people didn't understand why the whole district shouldn't bear the cost of the wastewater. So there was a lot of groundwork to be done. So I think, I think before or after? Um, that was that was well before the 218 process. We started a number of months, um, but there was a lot of outreach, and I think it was effective because, as I say, some people were very aware of the situations, particularly long-time residents up there. Others were completely in the dark. Um, it's some sort of thing that you don't like to think about unless you're forced to. Um, so there was a real learning curve for a number of people up in that up in that neighborhood, and um, it was you know it, it's a bit of a shock. We Stephanie went up a number of times and explained the financial side of things, and we were also discussing the regulatory, the compliance part, and the political side. Like who else is going to will the county take over the system? No, the county doesn't want to do it. You know, lots of options. So. A lot of non-engineering solutions were discussed that were political or financial, um, and they were eventually abandoned as not applicable or not feasible. So that was part of that long, long community discussion. And I think people are now all on board, like, yeah, there has to be an engineering solution, and this is the way to do it. So I think it's great that you were able to, after our last meeting up there, to get together with the, that group of homeowners and sort of hammer out this, because when we saw them at the at the recent committee meeting, they all seemed to be on board with it, and they seemed to, be, to really understand what was going on. So um, it took a long time to get there. It's been about a year, I'm guessing, um, is my recollection. And, uh, but I think it's worthwhile, because I think they do understand it's a short-term um, solution in order to get the information they need to be confident about a long-term rate increase. So I think everybody that I spoke to understood that, yes, this wasn't the end of the story. It was the beginning of the educational process. And it's still going to cost some money. So I think it's a great outcome. I'm real pleased that you were able to get everybody on board and get it to this point. Yeah, I, I agree that yeah. the fact that there's nobody here this evening, um, you know, shows that the buy-in is significant. I know the Budget and Finance Committee, you know, has worked very hard on this, and I know um, staff has reached out to the people in the community a lot. 
So, um, thank you, okay, for getting something really meaningful and, you know, not the final solution, but it's the right step, and it seems like it's the first step of two steps, so, good. Um, any other board discussion at this point? Uh, my involvement with this is, you know, I saw that 377 bucks a month, and I said, you know, wow, you know, I'm not going to... Or something didn't seem right to me. So anyway, I, I, you know, I had the idea of you know installing this step system um, recycle, you know, system, which I think you know I'm not saying it's the best thing to go. And then I, you know, I discuss, um, but I understand that the rate increase is a three. There's three parts, and one is the cost. And what I what I really don't know about this water district. If, for example, if somebody for staff goes out and does a repair, you know, say like James goes out and does a repair, does he put that on his time say, oh, I went to... Yeah. And I, I would repeatedly ask Brian, hey, Brian, can you give me, you know, some cost information on the one well, in the past, anyway. So, and I have not been provided with that. And then the second... Um, cost is, you know, there was several repairs from the engineer reports that, I don't know, there was, you know, 70,000 or whatever, there was like about three or four different projects that were done, so there was an increased cost for the, the, the system, the way it was doing, and then finally there's a study thing, and um, I, don't, I don't really think that, you know, I don't think this is rocket science, but I think there is, there's certain studies that need to be made. And I'm not saying my plan is the right way, but I do believe that we can get proposals at no cost from engineering firms. To, hey, what do you recommend here? Um, and then how much, are, what, what cost would you do? So then th that way we, we would have the, that third thing, that third cost down. I'm just, would, my recommendation is that all these numbers are backed up and totaled and so that, you know, that I have you know, I've been asking, for, did, did you, let, me, let me see this, because when I got on, when I talked to Matt Machado, I said, you know, you know, something, did, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really sure if that's, you know, really good. And then, the other thing was, is then when we also discussed the part about the county taking over, um, you know, just taking this whole thing over, and it's only 56 houses, so, but, it's also environmentally, beneficial thing. I'm not sure that I'm trying to impact, you know, exactly the thing. What I've been told is the nitrogen um, pollution in the river um, is mainly bad during this I and I is infiltration. Bill, why don't we do this in engineering? This is the absolute thing. We okay, well, no, I'll, I'll, yeah, okay. no, exactly. And so, I look forward to this, and I think Rick looks forward no, to it. No, no, I think okay. it'll, 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 it, well, anyway, I'll just, it'll I'll, be on the agenda for it'll, we should put it in the engineering committee. But I guess my point is, is to why don't we just get these, get a package of the numbers together, like I said, the, th the three different things, and then, but and then finally the third thing, the engineering committee that will decide, and then we can get no the, engineering we committee get, doesn't decide a lot. It recommends, <laughs> and then we can get proposals rather than just say, you know, because Brian, I think the other thing just said just a lump sum of hundred whatever. Thing. We can, I, I believe that we can take that up and get proposals. And, we'll, we'll, we'll spend all the time in the world. Right? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The, we'll. The okay, we got an uh, engineering committee coming up, not terribly far from it. Okay. Now, so. So okay. we're asking for for two part to uh, you saw in the. Uh, the, the agenda we're asking for the, the board of direct staff to proceed with Prop 218, authorize staff to finalize and mail the draft Proposition 218 notice to the affected property owners and customers, and two, appoint the board secretary to serve as arbiter. Okay. Um, would you like to make a motion on that? I'm, well, uh, just, just to back up, so what we're voting on, just to be clear, okay. is. Um, I mean, we're still playing around with the, the numbers on this, or, or no, this would be the draft. This this, this is so the this is final numbers. We have a. So it's three years. Right. It's three years going up twenty percent of each year. At the end of year three, it would be two hundred fifty-seven dollars and forty-seven cents per month. 
Yeah, I, 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 well, I'm not prepared to, to, to go ahead and... Uh, I make the motion that we authorize so. staff to finalize and mail the draft yeah. Proposition 218 notice to the affected property owners and customers. And part two, to appoint the board secretary to serve as arbiter to this Prop 218 process. So moved. Okay, I hear a motion and a second, and discussion is good at this point, I think. So... Um, um, just, I just oh, want to make, okay. maybe allay some of your concerns. We did talk about during the cost allocation discussions earlier in the year, we're talking about what's the, you know, we're revising that old $4,000 number. There was a lot of discussion about billable hours for staff versus unbillable admin time. So that was, we, we did have that discussion. Um, you may not have been present at that meeting, but I, we talked about specific costs and how you had calculated those, I believe. And I, I believe that was in a board meeting, not a committee meeting, but you might be able to correct me, Stephanie. Um, so, at one point, I, I saw those figures and I was satisfied that, that the cost, as far as the labor and, and that sort of thing, were adequately defined. Um, but I can't remember when that meeting was, it was some time ago. But again, I, I saw the information, you may not have been present though, so I, I can't be sure when that happened. And, and to answer Bill's questions, all cost accounting um, finance codes to Fair Creek. Each individual purchase is coded to all the materials, materials, and overtime, staff time, separate spots on the time cards, is all cost accounting, all to charge to here. Okay. Okay. Um, shall we have a roll call vote on this, Holly? Yes. Director Bruce. Yes. Director Ratcliffe. Yes. President Bachman. Yes. Director Smallman. No. Okay. Okay. Um, let's move on to um, item 10E, which is the annual em uh, employee reimbursement. And just everyone should have received in their copies back a, a revised a revised version for a slightly higher. Everybody comfortable with? Okay, and um, do we need to approve this? Okay, as um, so, we just accept it. Accept it. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure. Public comment on it. I got a mean question. A mean question? Meeting yeah. question? Okay. I didn't understand the word. Well, I guess my understanding is the revision was to add uh, reimbursements to board members. Uh, this. You, you know, we went through a lot of explanation last year about how board members are employees. And somehow, board members were left off of this report. So, my main question is, since this is the finance director's fifth year here, what about the last four years? 
I think it was an issue with just this year specifically. I'm pretty sure I've seen board, board reimbursements on bill list before this year. So I'll bet that there's a board reimbursement in the last look. five years that was not disclosed in this way. She's going to go back I mean, I can, go back, I, can, I can go back and look. That's, That's why I said it's a mean question. But Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, Director Smallman did bring it to our attention, and I had someone go back. We did have recent changeover of, of staff, and so I had someone go through with very specific instructions, and so... For so I got one more main question. Mm -hmm. um, this district spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on new accounting software mm -hmm. in the last few years, and so in my mind, I spent my career as a computer programmer, and I have a feeling that there's a button you push, and the report comes out. No, because depending on where it gets coded to, it's gonna get it's gonna be going to different accounts, um, and so there's no you know this is coded to part of the you know annual disclosure thing, and so the way that that they do it is they go through all the employees and board members that we've had during the year, and there's they go through and pull any of the by hand that they've had. by hand. I mean on the system. But I mean by hand, really. Mm -hmm. And so somebody's going to notice uh, that this reimbursement was 50 bucks and it does not get disclosed by hand. I mean, it's a computer. It sits there and you can sort it by a dollar amount and then export it in and put it there. Well, okay, if you can sort it, that means you're getting something that you start with that you sort. We look at it. And you, 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 you throw out the stuff that's below 100 bucks. But this part that's at the top, Includes board members. We are opening up the AP vendor file employee name by employee name by employee name. A little bit manual, it only happens once a year. All right, thanks. <coughs> okay. Um, I don't think we need to do anything. We, we accept this and um, good to go. Okay. Um, let's move. On to, I've got a couple of sheets to, um, put together. To item 10F, um, the compensation of the acting district manager. Um, it's recommended that the board of directors review this memo and adopt the attached resolution approving a, approving a salary increase of 21.42% for Rick Rogers classification. Director of Operations to the position of Acting District Manager, effective 5 p.m. of September 4th, 2018. And this is the same way we did it. The split the difference. Time. We just duplicated the same process and definitely put the numbers together. Okay. Um, seems reasonable to me. Um, a bit of board discussion before I go to public. Is that? Um, um, well, I think, that, I mean, the, the last time, wasn't it that you were going to uh, take the difference between what Jim was making and what you were making and then split it in half? That's what this is. That's, that's, that's what, what this is. is. Yeah. That's what okay. This is as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The same thing we did. So that Just to note, last right. time, though, the board did award the full differential. The, the full differential last time? Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just, I just, I don't know. I thought that was, I thought that was a, that's a good. Oh, sounds fair to me. <laughs> okay. Um, any other board discussion first? Uh, excuse me. I presume that um, depending on the length of Rick's service moving forward, we would have the opportunity to review this on an annual basis. Annual basis. basis. I assume so. Is that for the board's budget? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, any I assume it could change from being acting to full district. It would be a whole process. Yeah. Right. Um, public comment. Um, Lou stood up first. So I'm gonna... Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. You're going to have to bear with me because this is not a subject I'm used to talking about. Talking about individual salaries in the day of light. For in public is, in my mind, inappropriate. But you know, obviously, you've had the council review this, so I'm gonna. I feel compelled to speak on the subject. If someone were to ask me, does Rick deserve a salary increase? I would say resoundingly yes. But the way you're doing it, I think, deserves a little 
thought. Uh, in my mind, at best, this is not well thought out because it's too simplistic. And at worst, it's a solution in search of a problem. Which gets me to my two questions. Number one, and Margaret just alluded to it, if you give Rick a raise of 21%, presumably because he's doing Brian's job, if you go out and hire a district manager from the outside, do you now reduce his salary by 21% using the same reverse logic? I think that's a good question. You need to ask yourself before you entertain this. And a bigger question, number two, is if Rick deserves more money because he's doing Brian's job, essentially, does that mean James deserves more money because he's going to be doing Rick's job, and then Nate deserves more money because he's going to be doing James' job? I mean, where does this stop? I, mean, th I think this needs to be thought about a little more than just splitting something in the middle and saying, yeah, it sounds good to me. That's my comment. Well, Mr. Around, Holloway, please. I was around uh, four years ago, and I think you, you really did a short trip uh, just now to what really took place four years ago. Four years ago, um, Mr. Rogers made the exact same recommendation that uh, during the interim, we should make incrementally about half as much uh, on the way to uh, the, the, the former district manager. And that's exactly the same recommendation that Mr. Rogers is making today. But when that recommendation was made four years ago, Director Bruce said, that's not enough. Let's give him all of it. So that's what's different this time. I, I guess Director Bruce isn't going to speak up like that and say, let's give him the 42% raise or whatever it is. Um, so I think this is, uh, this is just and reasonable, 21% during the interim. And um, I've got more to say about the rest, but uh, I think that's fair. I think it's what he's asked for. And I don't think he should, I think uh, district funds are too dear to just uh, throw them at an employee the way it was done four years ago. I think you should give him exactly what he asked for, and, and, and it looks like you need to do that. Um, as far as the other employees, you know, I mean, this is part of a bigger process. And um, I think we need to hear what Rick thinks we have to do going forward. Um, and we've been around, we've done this before. So my feeling is, uh, you know, don't, don't repeat the past. Don't do the exact same thing as before. Um, and so it kind of seems to me that we have to hear from Mr. Rogers what he thinks ought to happen in the future. And so maybe all those other employees, maybe they should get promoted. Uh, that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, but that kind of means it's a one-way trip for Mr. Rogers. There's no going back. If all those people get promoted, there's no, there's no, there's no spot left for him to go back to. So I think this is a process, and we need to hear from him first about what he thinks is right for himself and for the whole district. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else? Okay, I don't see any other public comment uh, back here. Um, do you I want to? I can answer a couple of those questions. Sure. Um, first of all, there's another item I mentioned in the night, and I'll talk more in depth about the positions. But, I feel the compensation is what it is. And how you can remember that stuff back, because that's exactly what happened. That's pretty more remarkable. But the district does have contracts that uh, the director of operations, the deputy director of operations, is under signed contracts that have provisions in there in during and absence. When Mr. Furtado was moved as acting director of operation, the contract called for an automatic 5% increase to his salary. Uh, as he is in a temporary position. Um, there is no provision in the contract to go to the district manager. That's a contract employee. So it's a little different on my end. Um, this is what we asked, I asked for before. I feel it's fair at this point in time. Um, and the other employees, um, hopefully, 
as time goes on, you know, the deputy director of operations position was uh, adopted and filled as uh, succession planning for my position. Um, so we have been working on this, um, and they are covered uh, in their contracts. Uh, but if there's other changes, there will be other changes. We'll see. I think right now everybody's satisfied. Okay. I think this I think this amount is correct. I'm not recommending that it go to um, the full 42.83 uh, percent. Um, any other? Well, I, I do say that the situation is different now than it was four years ago. So we have people like Stephanie who were are now well established in carrying a, a heavier load than perhaps they were some unfilled or recently filled positions. I believe in the last time you were interim. So I think. We have a much stronger management support team now than, than um, when you did this position before. And if I'm recalling correctly, the vacancies that were either still present or had been recently filled. So <coughs> things were not as in um, robust condition as the last time that was filled. So. But the manager's job is still a very heavy load. Yeah. I mean, there's, I don't want to say there's a lot of cleanup, but there's a lot of responsibility yes. in that position. And you're not done acting. You, your role as an operations manager is not completely okay. No, in the past of your memory at this time. So I have a feeling you have your hands and and responsibilities in that also. Okay. Um, any other uh, comment? Um, would we want to do that? Do we have a uh, feeling of un un I'll unanimity? I'll make a motion to uh, for the. Interim, Mr. Benzer's salary to be raised be per the, was 21%? Per 21.42%. 21.42%. Okay. okay. Um, I'll second that. Any other discussion? Um, we can do it on a voice vote, I believe. So all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, None saying no, so it passes four to zero with one absent. Um, let's move on to item 10G, which is the conf 2018 <coughs> conflict of interest code. Um, I think this would be something good for um, you. To sure. Um, I think everyone here knows that the district's required to update its conflict of interest code every couple of years. Um, the board does not need to um, actually approve the revisions to the code, but rather um, allow them to be submitted to um, the code reviewing body, which here is Santa Cruz County. Um, I understand that there's at least one controversial issue uh, in connection with this conflict of interest code, and that's whether um, board members and perhaps others uh, are covered by um, 17200? 87200. 87200. Thank you. Um, ultimately, whatever the district's conflict of interest code says is not controlling. State law is controlling as to um, whether that status applies to board members and possibly committee members. Um, my approach to reviewing, to revising the conflict of interest code has been to um, ensure that everybody who should be covered by the code is required to file a report, Form 700 and report somehow. Um, so if the FPPC is correct that board members um, <coughs> aren't subject to that provision, then um, they will at least be subject to the conflict of interest code, which will require them to um, file a Form 700. If, on the other hand, state law requires board members um, to be covered uh, by 87200, then that is the law. There, there's no way around it. It doesn't matter what the conflict of interest code says. But ultimately, we can submit this update to the code review body and the code review body and determine whether the update is appropriate. Okay, so there's no action necessary tonight? Um, the action would be to authorize to, to the, the submission to the, the but not approval. Changes to the code review body. Okay. Um, 
Anybody would like to comment on this before we go to the public for discussion on this? Okay, neither would I. Uh, Mr. Holloway? I might need a little bit more than three minutes for this. No, not this is, no. You can okay, limit well, it to three minutes. I'm going to tell you that this will lead to litigation. Um, the, what Section 87200 refers to are public officials who manage public investments. At the last board meeting, Slate made pays brag about three million bucks in the bank. Okay, that means you guys get to decide how to invest three million bucks of cash reserves. Also, um, we just heard this presentation tonight about more than eight million dollars of uh, projects that you're going to go borrow money for. And again, that's millions of dollars of capital investments. So we proved, you know, after years of litigation, we proved in court in this county, Judge Gallagher made a finding, a, a statement of finding a fact that county water district members are subject to 8700. Uh, now that's under appeal. That's under appeal. And maybe Terry Vieira is going to skate out of this somehow. That was a key element of the fine against Terry Vieira and the attorney's fees, which are over $100,000. So, hey, if he wins, if he gets out of that appeal, then I'll agree. But for the time being, it's been proven in court. A, a Santa Cruz Superior Court judge says you're subject to 87200. So I don't know where anybody gets off saying, oh, well, if the law says this or that, it's been proven in court. It's been proven in a trial. So if you think you can get past this point now and say you're not 87200 filers, you're wrong. It's going to get litigated. It's going to get re-litigated. Now, I guess in the old days, this was called collateral estoppel. Something already came to a court and already got decided. And uh, the state Supreme Court came out with a, 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 an opinion this year that basically said, we're not going to have res, res judicata and collateral estoppel anymore. We're going to call it claim preclusion and issue preclusion. So this falls under issue preclusion. County Water District board members are subject to 87200, at least in this county. Um, so I, I'm really sick of arguing about this anymore. Um, now the library recognizes this. They put it in their conflict of interest code. Now here's where I need a little bit more time because of the FPPC. It's completely being misrepresented what the FPPC said. What the FPPC said was if you don't put this in your conflict of interest code, we're not going to enforce it. Well, I don't care if they're going to enforce it. I'm going to enforce it. And I've already enforced it. And I'm going to keep enforcing it. So if you want to keep fighting and keep wasting money, you wasted a quarter million dollars defending your friend about conflicts of interest, cut it out. OK. Um, would anybody else like to speak on this item? Mr. Foltz. serve in the committees and there's probably a better argument that maybe the committee members shouldn't be subject to it. I know there's been some discussion that that may <clears throat> excuse me, inhibit people from wanting to join committees. Um, I'm actually in favor of people having to do that. I think most people it's just going to be a one page uh, report and I think people um, as part of the training to get into uh, serving in a uh, capacity, whether it's a board member or a committee, need to get used to that. I think it's something that, that um, in the interest of transparency, we just need to do. With respect to the 87200, I, I, I'm, I'm really stunned that this would even be controversial. Um, uh, you know, I, I do have to, I mean, I do file a form 700. Every one of you, I, I'm not elected. Right? I don't hold the same public trust that you all do. And even if there's some opinion or it's under appeal or what have you, why in the world would you not err on the side of transparency until it's fully adjudicated? So I would just hope that we just kind of do the right thing here uh, and continue to require committee members, board members, and selected employees to file a Form 700 and just make it easy. It's, it's not that big a deal to have an online form now. I mean, it took me 10 minutes maybe to do it. And if, if someone needs help, 
I'm sure there's a way for one of us in the admin committee or Holly or somebody to help them out and walk through it in terms of what to do, but it's actually pretty easy to do. This is not a, this is not a burden of any kind. And unless you're doing massive amounts of business locally, um, it, it, it really is a one or two page type form, max. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll close out uh, public comments, seeing that uh, the two people in the public have spoken, and bring this back uh, to the board. Does any thoughts from council? Well, I understand all the positions being presented. I think that the way the conflict of interest code is written um, is erring in the side of disclosure and transparency because until the uh, Vieira case, until the appeal of the Vieira case is final, that trial court judgment isn't binding and currently there is some contrary, it's not guidance exactly, but suggestion from the FPPC that they view this same issue differently uh, please. Uh, no, 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 no. Please, no. Please, so, don't disrupt this meeting by interjecting comments. So the reason that I am suggesting that the board submitted in this form is because in light of the ambiguity, if, and I'm not saying 87200 doesn't apply, I'm saying if it doesn't apply, then the board members are captured by um, the reporting requirements in the Conflict of Interest Code, which requires them to report. I would be happy to help submit a revised conflict of interest code as soon as the Vieira appeal is final and that point has become a determined point of state law. Um, but in the meantime, I think this version errs in the side of tra transparency. Now keep in mind that board members should absolutely consult counsel if they run into an issue that involves trying to decide whether a board member is subject to 87200 or is subject to the provisions of these conflict of interest codes. Please talk to me. There are, this is an area where seeking and obtaining a legal opinion is important and I strongly recommend it um, because state law is controlling whatever state law is, not this conflict of interest code. So if you are subject to 87200, um, those obligations, under state law, those obligations you're controlling regardless of what this conflict so please consult with me for any specific situations that may arise. Okay. And I would hope that um, you would reach out to the director who is not here this evening so that um, that's made yes, as absolutely. clear to that person as this is. Um, regarding um, the public members of committees, any thoughts on that? Um, how we, um, should we reconsider that in the future or? Um, Shall we leave it at this? Okay. May I say something? Sure. Um, when you, when I tell somebody at the county that we have hired, or not hired, but we have appointed another um, committee member, they don't know, they don't understand that. They put them down as directors. They don't have a committee thing that they can plug in there. They don't, nobody does committees but us. Okay. They have committees. Uh, no, Bruce, no, Bruce, no, Bruce, no, 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 quit disrupting this meeting by interjecting. No, please. Okay, staff um, asked to be uh, recognized, and I recognize staff. I have not recognized the public. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so we're back at board discussion on this. And anybody else? Here? I had a couple of questions. So, if other districts are subject to the 87200 filing requirement, or they're considering this issue, in addition to the library, do you, do you know if there are other organizations that have incorporated this as a precaution, or are there examples of how it should be incorporated outside our jurisdiction? Well, I, I don't know, and I would be hesitant to look to other organizations. Um, I would trust the code compliance body to compare our code to other comparable bodies rather than sort of poking around online to decide, you know, to see how other entities may be deciding to do this and simply follow their lead. Um, I think we need to make our own decision on this point subject to review and approval by the uh, 
um, Code Review and Body, which is the organization that is best situated to ascertain whether so that's correctly done our conflict of interest work. So that brings up my next question, and that is the Code Review Body, being the county, are they going to take a look at our document and revert with any comments, questions, or advice based on current local case law or other precedents that are informative of this issue? Or are they simply going to receive it and sort of leave us hanging? No rubber stamp. Chip, please do not interrupt. Um, okay, if you interrupt again, I'm going to call a recess and figure out how to keep that from happening. Um, because you've been disrupting the meeting by doing so. Um, so. I don't know exactly what their process is. Something that we could consider doing is submitting, um, I mean, a cover letter explaining the issues that they simply can't gloss over it. Um, I don't know if there's a mechanism to do that or if we simply submit it online. Mm -hmm. I send it in. Send it in. Um, so we could flag it for their attention, see what they do with it. I mean, the process is we submit it for review, they review it and either approve it or send comments back to the district. Okay. So I, I can't speak to the sufficiency of their process, um, but we can flag an issue for them to encourage them to take a close look. Okay. Okay. Um. Uh. Well, why did I, my feeling on this is it, it really, to me, from, I don't, know, I don't quite understand the motivation to even in, in, in getting involved with this, and um, I just can't see the value of making any changes on the, whatever the rule of law or conflict of interest, and, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to vote for this. Okay. So, uh, um, it just it doesn't seem, you know, and then Mr. Fold said, oh, if it's just a matter of filling out the issue, he's right, that, you know, everybody should fill out the 700 forms if you're on a committee, and you should, you should not violate conflict of interest, period, so, you know. Okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to vote for this. Okay. Um, I see a pen up. I, I have a, a just a follow-on question. Is there... Is there a reason not to include the 87200 provision at this time? Would we be incurring a risk? Would we be um, failing to follow guidance or direction from the state or from the controlling body? Well, my thinking is that, again, because state law is controlling here, if 87200 applies, it applies, whether we say it does or it doesn't. So if it, the way we would, if, if we believe 87200 applies to board members, what we would do to this conflict of interest code is remove board members from it. Okay. So they wouldn't have any reporting requirements listed under this conflict of interest code because they'd be covered by um, a higher power, yeah. so to speak. So that's, that is why I'm saying that to me, the more, in the light of, in, in the face of ambiguity, the more transparent option that requires a greater de degree of disclosure is to put board members in the schedule that requires disclosure pursuant to the conflict of interest code, because then they need to comply with the conflict of interest code disclosure provisions and 87200 if it applies. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Um. Any other? I, I think uh, Dana has explained the situation to my satisfaction. Okay, and she has to, um, me too. So, um, do I hear a motion or do you? I would move approval of the amended conflict of interest code as submitted for our consideration by our legal counsel. Okay, um, I can second or you can? I'll second. Okay. Um, and no more discussion, I presume. So, Holly, could you take a roll call vote on this? Absolutely. Director Bruce? Yes. Director Radcliffe? Yes. Director Bachman? Yes. Director Smallman? No. Okay. 
Um, let's move on to item 10H, the district manager. Now 6.30, so we are going to uh, reconvene the, the uh, September 20th um, meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And um, there were no uh, reportable actions taken in closed session. Um, I'll ask staff and other directors, are there any additions and deletions to the open session agenda? I have none. Okay. Um, then we'll move on to the oral communications portion of the meeting and um, so this is a time that you can speak on any subject within the purview of the water district uh, preferably not on anything that's on tonight's agenda and the uh, limitation on that is three minutes so um, who would like to speak I see Ms. Lowen pardon um, the, or the yeah the podium okay go ahead um, that would be a convenience for the recording Thank you. Um, Mr. Holloway. I'm Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Um, at the last board meeting, uh, there was an agenda item to hire an interim district manager. And uh, in the discussion at the time, it became clear that there was an application from John Presley, who is the retired uh, Santa Cruz County Public Works Director. Um, it was a little bit unclear during the meeting uh, exactly who the person was, he, his name wasn't said exactly, and um, later on I obtained the uh, application, the resume, uh, which had been sent to the entire board prior to the last board meeting. 
Um, also, I requested the resignation letter from uh, former <coughs> district manager Brian Lee, which was not in the packet for the last board meeting. Um, and so these two items, the resignation letter, which uh, led to the appointment of the interim district manager and the application from John Presley. Uh, these were not presented to the public, and that is a Brannock violation as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the Brannock's very clear that uh, when there's an open meeting, an open session for an open meeting, that all materials that are presented to the majority of the board should be presented to the public prior to the meeting or maybe even uh, left up here at, you know, so we can receive them. Um, so, I mean, uh, despair and dismay that this board will ever comply with the Brown Act. Uh, you seem to think that anything you get is confidential, you don't need to share it with us. But the fact is that um, that application from Mr. Presley was kind of pitched in over the transom. If, um, if Mr. Presley was applying for the finance director position, for example, then uh, the, whoever was the district manager at the time would be in a position to say, hey, show me your resume, and I'll treat it in confidence. But because of the particular situation that there was last month, when there was no district manager, because the district manager had resigned, Mr. Presley is a sophisticated, has a sophisticated understanding of the Brown Act. And he pitched his resume over the transom without any, without any assurance that it would be kept confidential. And he knew, he knew that that was the precise moment when the board might make a decision one way or the other about an interim district manager. And that's the exact moment when this, when the public should have been aware that Mr. Presley uh, had made an application. So you violated the Brown Act, and I don't know when you're going to begin to abide by it. Um, okay. Anybody else want to comment during oral? Okay. Seeing none. Um, I will think about Mr. Holloway's comments and think about them. Thank you. Um, so we will move on to 9A, um, the edu education grant final report under unfinished business. And um, I'll let staff um, introduce this if they'd like to. Um, Jen. Okay. So, um, one of the one of the 2016 watershed education grants that was awarded was to Fred and Roberta McPherson for to make a movie or video called The Turkey Foot, which describes uh, the area of the San Lorenzo River where um, where Bear Creek, Bear Creek, and Boulder Creek join the San Lorenzo River, correct? And, um, and so Fred and Mick Roberta are here tonight to present their video to the board for your consideration for acceptance of their final, this is their final report. So. Right. I just want to say that uh, it's a pleasure to be here and share it. It's taken us a good year to, to get this done. And uh, a lot of time uh, was spent in uh, writing the script and doing the research for it. And uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here to present it tonight. We presented one uh, oh, two or three years ago about Fall Creek, which dealt with the southern end of the Ben Loman Mountain and our intakes on Fall Creek and uh, our treatment plant there. This one deals with the northern end of the, the, the mountain uh, where we uh, have our other uh, surface water intake. So, it's sort of a compliment to the one we've done before. So we can see it, and if there's any questions afterwards, we'd be glad to answer the questions. Great. I'm going to hit the lights, and we'll get
The eastern boundary of the San Lorenzo Valley and the San Lorenzo River watershed is somewhat subtle and difficult to distinguish, looking toward Loma Prieta, the highest peak in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Ben Lomond Mountain, as the western boundary, is the most visible and therefore obvious edge, extending from its southern end at the Pogonip area of Santa Cruz to Boulder Creek, the northernmost town <coughs> in the San Lorenzo Valley. The eastern facing slope of Ben Lomond Mountain was formed by the vertical movement of the now inactive Ben Lomond Fault. Along the northern end of the mountain, the Ben Lomond Fault and Zianti Fault, which is still active today, both played an important role in the formation of the Boulder Creek area. Because of the way Boulder Creek enters the river from the west in the area known to local residents as the Junction, and just a few hundred yards upriver, Bear Creek flows in from the east, early settlers thought the pattern they formed resembled the foot of a turkey with the center and back toes of the San Lorenzo River and the two side toes representing each creek. When we examine the early newspapers, the first reference to the turkey foot is in 1874, when the crews were surveying the area for the San Lorenzo Valley Food and Transportation Company. It is proposed to commence blooming at or near Felton and extend the work to the mouth of Boulder, Bear, and San Lorenzo Creek, which forms a turkey foot. A year later, the area was referred to as the Forks, and in that year, during the dispute of as to where the location of the post office should be, either Boulder Creek or Lorenzo, this was called the natural center of the neighborhood. Junction Park, operated by the Boulder Creek Rec Department, is a popular spot in the summer for sunbathing and swimming, bunching off of diving rock, and community festivals. Throughout the year, there are also great opportunities for enjoying a myriad of wildlife, like mallards, wood duck, and the elusive American dipper. As the northeastern end of Ben Lomond Mountain was uplifted vertically along the Zianti Fault, the harder granitic quartz diorite that forms the core of the mountain was exposed and broken off in irregular chunks along Boulder Creek's upper tributaries. The jagged edges of the various sized boulders were then tumbled and rounded as they were carried from their origins down into Boulder Creek where the tumbling and smoothing continued all the way to the San Lorenzo River. Along their journey, the tumbling rocks acted like grist in a mill, carving out and exposing successive layers of the softer sedimentary sandstones, eroding away over millions of years, and helping to form Boulder Creek and parts of the Turkey Foot cutting down deeper here than almost any other place in the San Lorenzo Valley. More recent sandstone formations were cut through, all the way down into the underlying Butano sandstone, one of the oldest sedimentary formations in the Santa Cruz Mountains, which is exposed to Junction Park's diving rock, as well as upstream along Boulder Creek in the area of its confluence with Foreman Creek one of Boulder Creek's important tributaries. Along Boulder Creek is a beautiful riparian forest of white alders, part of the
of a habitat that includes mineral-loving California sisters, water striders, and overwintering ladybugs. <coughs> In winter, almost all of the water supply for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District comes from surface water allowing the district to rest as well. All of that surface water comes from Ben Lomond Mountain, and much of that surface water comes from tributaries to Boulder Creek, including Seavine, Silver, and Foreman Creeks. In the summer, the district's water supply comes from wells in the sand hills, predominantly in the areas of Ben Lomond, Bianchi, and Olympia. Above the confluence of Foreman and Boulder Creek is the district's Boulder Creek treatment plant. Here, water is treated from the three tributaries to Boulder Creek, Evine, Silver, and Foreman, along with water from the Rob Menzies Five Mile Pipeline to the south, carried in from Clear Creek and Sweetwater Creek before being distributed throughout the San Lorenzo Valley. Lower Bear Creek cuts down into the same Butano sandstone formation found at the junction and on the northeastern end of Ben Lomond Mountain. It is particularly well exposed in the area of the Bonnie Briar Gorge, which also contains mysterious rock inclusions that have strange forms, almost like burrows on a redwood tree. Walking Bear Creek provides many opportunities to investigate the geology of the area. Along the creek, it's also possible to discover primordial plants like liverworts, mosses, and graceful lady ferns. Not far from the Turkey Foot area, Ben Lomond Fault is joined by the Zianti Fault, dividing the watershed into fairly distinct geological and hydrological regions. Everything north of the Zianti Fault, which includes the Bear Creek watershed, is not well suited to providing a large water supply for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District because the underlying geological formations in this area lack the extensive granitic aquifers found south of the Zianti Fault on Ben Lomond Mountain. With the coming of winter rain, waterfalls form in steep hidden canyons all throughout the Bear Creek watershed. During one particularly heavy rain, a large Douglas fir became wedged by its root into an old cement dam above the Bonnie Briar Gorge. Fisheries biologist Don Allen was called in for his assessment of the situation. This is a serious problem. You don't have an obstruction in here. The fish can get through the dam above them fairly easily. The first thing you need to do is get this done the spur out of the way because it's it's got the uh, the jump to double in height and about four feet at the sill of the dam is now eight feet. It also goes beyond the dam, so it's hanging over. Don contacted Kristen Kittleson, fishery resource planner for the county of Santa Cruz. I think it'd be important to cut up stuff and then just leave it in the city so that it has a better chance to flush them out. After checking the obstruction, John Mowdry from Santa Cruz County Public Works was able to clear the way for open water flow to the dam, averting what could have developed into a big problem. After the dam was cleared, Don and 
Kristen returned to check the opening. A huge problem did develop not far downstream during a torrential rainstorm in early 2017 when the failed drain pipe washed out half of Lower Bear Creek Road. The San Lorenzo Valley Water District was quick to respond to the emergency, making certain there was no interruption of water service to over a thousand of their customers along Bear Creek Road. We put in a pipe down, so it just ran through here. Yeah. Eventually, Public Works spread black plastic over the area to help prevent further sliding. The same storm caused a large log jam at the point where Bear Creek enters the San Lorenzo River. Fortunately, it was washed away a few days later as the heavy <coughs> rains continued. Quiet Little Boulder Creek rose to within a short distance of the Junction Park fence, carrying away huge logs as it merged with the San Lorenzo River, causing more sliding, burying the sandy beach where swimmers and sunbathers had gathered during the summer. and submerging most of Diamond Rock and the Dam Down River in its rush toward the sea. <coughs> Witnessing the dynamic energy of nature at work in the area <coughs> of the turkey foot puts our human time scale into perspective in relation to geological time. Seeing the magnitude of these powerful geological processes over time helps us begin to comprehend the extraordinary forces continuously influencing this remarkable place. It has taken millions of years for the turkey foot to evolve into its present form. Since long before human existence, and we can only speculate about what this area might be like millions of years from now. Very cool. Um, <laughs> I think sometimes we take a, for granted the place we live in, and it helps for somebody to point out how special a place we're in. So I haven't really thought through this process. After, you know, we have a 
excellent presentation as far as I'm concerned. And I would like to open it up to um, the public uh, to, for comments or um, you know, some thoughts. And um, if Fred would like to take a question or two, that would be good. Would anybody like to comment from the public at this point? Okay, I, do, I don't see anybody. Um, we'll bring back to the board for our thoughts, and I think I've got a question or two, but I'll, I'll you know, offer it to uh, other directors. Okay, anybody want to make a... Fred and Roberta, uh, thank you again for the beautiful piece. That was just delightful. What a nice adventure in our neighborhood. Um, I know some of the reason for the the Bear Creek area not being very good for um, large water supplies, just the condo sandstone, so it's not very permeable, is that right? And I have heard that there are old oil wells in that area. Is that true, or is that like urban legend? Well, there's way up in the upper watershed, there's some old oil well mm -hmm. sites, but there's a number of uh, kind of impermeable uh, aquifers up Bear Creek and Kings Creek, and. Uh, Deer Creek and uh, all those areas. Uh, you can, there's wells up there, individual homeowners and wells, but uh, it's not uh, like down here in uh, Coil Hollow or up in the Olympia Quarry or somewhere like that, where there's a really good uh, groundwater supply, or up on the Ben Lomond Mountain, where there's uh, the surface water supply that's so good. So that, that's why it's different. And, and, uh, and this groundwater study that you're doing now, uh, they're considering that. And, uh, there's different basins, groundwater basins in the aquifers. So up, up above, designing your fault is not very good for a big supplies. Can I take a step closer oh. to the sure. Thank you. Yeah. I, I'm just thinking, I, I, I'm always amazed that, you know, how turbid that water, and I know, like, I remember hearing some figures about, you know, you would think after all this time that it would, but there's still so much, the amount of sediment that the river still continues to um, take out, it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, how, because you just look at that water and everybody says it's like, oh, that's like the milk chick <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, but, you know, I think there's some interest in trying to collect some of that water, but it's, you know, it's got so much turbidity, but uh, I don't know if you knew exactly how much sediment um, gets it goes all the way to the ocean, basically. Yeah. From, yeah. Well, that, that, that's a yeah. challenge because it yeah. does have that turbidity. And it is difficult to treat, especially out of the river, mm -hmm. not directly like that. That's why the, the city of Santa Cruz doesn't pump it up in the Loch Lomond when it's uh, turbid like that. Mm -hmm. It waits until it settles down. Then they pump it up. And I know at our treatment plants, we can't use the turbid water either at, uh, on Fall Creek or at the Boulder Creek place. You have to wait till it settles. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that erosion, well, that turbidity. There's erosion, there's more vineyards, there's more construction, there's a lot more activity in that for water. So it's a challenge. Uh, yeah, that, that, I think that also, I think, I think it's a real interest in this valley mm -hmm. is to provide that erosion control to, to, to minimize that amount of sediment that, you know. Yeah. And there's a lot of storm drain design, you know, to try to, um, but it's, it's a, I mean, it's a big, it's a big, big issue. That, you know, You're so. right. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to ask um, Fred a question. I'm, I'm curious about the phenomenon of the turkey foot, because it looks like uh, you've got a fault coming across, you've got the Zyani fault coming across there. Does it make a jog? Is there a fracture? So what, you've got Bear Creek coming in at one point and um, well, like Boulder Creek coming in. It, it's only about 100, it's like from here down to the river, away. It's only maybe a hundred yards of separation. And it's, you're exactly right. It's because the Zyne Fault goes right through there. It goes, you know, right down Bear Creek, maybe a little jog, you know, as it cuts through that formation there at the, the junction. But then it goes right up uh, Boulder Creek and on out through Big Basin and eventually out into, um, you know, uh, Rancho de Oso and the, uh, uh, the fault off shore. And, and uh, what, what I found so fascinating, it took me so long to research, is I finally figured out which way the Zyne fault is moving. It, it's sort of like the San Andreas is moving sideways. The southern part is going one way, 
but the southern part is also going up a little bit. And it's, but it's been doing that for millions of years. And that's why there's such an offset there along the Zyne Fault going right Bear Creek and Boulder Creek. It, it's, that's why the northern end of Ben Lomond Mountain is higher. It's pretty high. It's one of the highest points on Ben Lomond Mountain is right up there, Eagle Rock. So it's fascinating. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning. That's one of, been one of the treats about doing this. I've learned so much. I just really appreciate it. It was fun to see a little bit of geology. and We've been talking about the Butano Formation in you know other parts of the basin, so it's fun to see it out there at the surface. So. Roberta did. Is, she's the creation. She's the uh, uh, script writer, and she did the narrative. Uh, and uh, so she's a the, the artistic creative force. I, I really like that geeky stuff, like geology and the wildlife <coughs> stuff like that. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's, any staff uh, feedback? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll give you a chance. We will do that. <laughs> we won't forget to do that. <laughs> doesn't have any more um, questions, then I'll, okay, we have one um, action that we need to consider this evening, and that is to whether to uh, accept this final report. And if there's any discussion or a motion would be. Uh, I have I, I approval of this beautiful report submitted as part of the Watershed Education Grant received by President I'll second. Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think we can probably do this by uh, voice. Um, all in favor, um, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Very good. Thank you very much, both of you, for this. Aye. Beautiful. So, um, but we have a big agenda tonight, or at least uh, numerous items. So let's move on to 9B, which is the uh, Lompico Assessment District Oversight Committee appointments. So I would like to uh, get this started by, uh, okay, introduce, you know, any staff? Um, yes, uh, at, at, as the board is aware that there are three openings on the uh, PICO Assessment District Oversight Committee. At the August 2018 Board of Directors meeting, the board delayed filling vacancies on the committee to ensure compliance with the MADI Act. The direct mailer informing the PICO customers that the district was accepting applications to the Oversight Committee was mailed to all of Pico customers. The district has received five applications from customers of Lumpico to participate as a public member of the Oversight Committee. Uh, their applications are in your board packet for review. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I've made a few notes about how I think might be a good process for uh, doing this. And the first thing I do is like to ask the applicants, okay, who ha are here today, um, if they would like to, to uh, speak to their qualifications and interest and in part.